spiked out I could trip a referee Tell by my attitude That I most definitely from Everybody, hello. It's another episode of This Week in Startups, episode number 49. Tyler, the 50th episode right around the corner. Next Friday, special episode. Is it next Friday? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was the 7th we're doing it. Or is it the 30th? 30th. So on the 30th, in San, San Francisco, Francisco yeah. we are going to have a special episode. Uh, and the special episode will take place at? Microsoft has a secret location inside the city somewhere. Microsoft is going to host us for the 50th episode. We have a very special big guest. Correct. We're not saying who it is yet. Secret location, secret guest. And there are 100 seats in the live studio yes. audience? Yes, 100, 100, 120, 130, something. Like and uh, we'll probably have about 20 of our uh, VIPs there. But uh, the other 100 tickets we're going to give out to the uh, loyal uh, Twist fans, the right. Startup fans. And how are we going to do that? They're going to email Tyler at Mahalo.com? They can tweet me, I guess. They, they can, can tweet a, at they, Steve Decline. They can say, hey, at Steve Decline, I want a ticket. That's OK. So they tweet at Steve Decline, I want a ticket, and then maybe you'll get them a ticket. So Tyler is going to give out the 100 tickets. I have nothing to do with it if you don't get in. Um, it's been almost a year now. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And the show is just on fire. Kevin yep. Pollock had his one-year uh, one anniversary. The network is doing great. Mm -hmm. This week in cloud computing, this mm -hmm. week in Android, this mm -hmm. week in iPad. Mm -hmm. Taped a second show yesterday. This week in venture capital becoming a surprise hit out uh -huh. of nowhere. Uh, and Mark Suster is now the permanent host. Mm -hmm. So uh, go to This Week In, subscribe to everything. And it's really helpful as uh, fans of the show if you tweet it and you Facebook it and you watch those numbers go up. And I, I see people are actually starting to tweet it and Facebook it. And really, is, the social media thing actually is, uh, for all the hype and nonsense about social media, it actually works. Right. Um, what an amazing guest we have. I've been trying for literally 49 weeks to have Sky <laughs> Dayton on the program. He's very busy. Uh, he has no job, but he's still incredibly busy and can't make it on the show. I can joke with him because we're actually very good friends now after a couple of years of dunking off obscene amounts of money playing high stakes poker here in Los Angeles. Um, but uh, you guys know Sky Dayton uh, primarily as the founder of Earthlink, uh, which was a huge success, obviously, and continues to be. Uh, he also founded E-Companies, which uh, did Business.com, which was a tremendous exit. Jamdat, another tremendous exit. Uh, and Boingo, uh, which is the uh, somewhat affordable Wi-Fi that you get in airports. So when you're in Narita Airport in Japan, like I was, and you can't get on the internet, it's actually Boingo is there. Uh, and of course, Helio, uh, and uh, many angel investments, et cetera. So welcome to the program, Sky Dayton. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for finally making it. Glad to finally be here. Yeah. Hopefully, it'll be like a fine wine. It just needed to ripen a little bit. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and so you've seen the program before. We start the program with Ask Jason, because that's everybody's favorite segment, Entrepreneur Calls. They ask us a question. We give them an honest answer. We try to help them. Between the two of us, we've got about 30 years or so of uh, screwing up startups, making huge <laughs> mistakes, uh, banging our heads against the wall, and then once in a while having a victory lap, in your case, having five. Uh, so we have, uh, who's counting? Craig uh, is on the phone, and uh, let's, have, let's have Craig ask a question to Sky and Jason. Craig, are you there? Yes. Craig, you're calling from the 204. Where do you hail from? Uh, from Winnipeg, Manitoba, in Canada. Whoa, Canada. Yeah. Uh, we've had Canada on the program many times. Are you going to uh, do a booyah thing? There's no booyah. We no should booyah. get a booyah. It's, it's more yeah. like we have a gladiator theme here. Yeah. So yeah. it's more like, are you entertained? <laughs> is this not why you've come here? Yes. Okay, so Craig is entertained. We can check that off. Okay, uh, Craig, you have a question for us. Let's hear it. Yeah, I do. Uh, well, first of all, um, I know this is old news, but congratulations on becoming a father. Thank you so much. I um, actually am getting the baby starting to sleep through the night, like seven hours at a clip, eight hours at a clip uh, this week. That's gold time. Wow, holy that's cow. I didn't realize how much I missed sleep. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I've, been, I've been literally on tilt for four <laughs> months. I've been exhausted. The bags under my eyes. I put. It, I, I was in makeup for about three hours to get these bags down to where they are, and I still look like a zombie. Um, but thank you very much. I'm, I'm actually, assuming you're a father as well. I yeah, I am, and I actually I wrote an article about sleep deprivation over at the uh, blog that I contribute to called Functional Father. If you want to check it out. Oh, it, Functional it Father. I will check that tips. out. Uh, but yeah, my, my question was, uh, you know, it's kind of a general question, but um, for startups, kind of the, the first litmus test is uh, you ask your friend and family, you know, is this a good idea? And you kind of get like the stock three answers like, this is a great idea, I'd buy it, or 
no, I don't get it, or, you know, someone else is already doing it. But I was just wondering, um, how much, you know, should it be more formal than that in all cases? Should you actually go out and try and, like, find out, is this a, is this a good idea? Will people actually buy it? Will, you know, okay. is there interest? Is somebody else already doing it? So to summarize your question, you're starting a company. How much market research do you need to know before you actually pull the trigger, start spending money, start raising capital? Yeah, because uh, it can't all be like feel the dreams. If they if you build it, they will come kind of thing. So. To a certain extent, um, I, I'll give you my short answer, which is every time I've started a business, and uh, I would say only about 10 or 20 percent of the people I explained it to really um, thought it was a good idea. And I would say another half of them said, I, I don't understand what a blog is, or I, I don't know the internet is. And mm-hmm. so by definition, if you're really ahead of the curve and you're, you know, whoever it is, you know, Krista Wolf trying to explain MySpace to people, or, right. you know, they're not going to understand it. So you have to be careful who you get the research from. I, I tend to look at what the early adopters are doing, but Sky, you've, you've done a bunch of companies and you've also invested in a bunch. How, how is your process for deciding to actually pull the trigger, start spending money in a vertical? I think the first and most important thing is um, what's your own inspiration for it? What camera are we looking at? Let's see. Yeah, just look at me. Okay. If you just, we, we just talk. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the, do you have sort of a visceral um, understanding of it from your own experience? And I yeah. think that's where the best companies come from. Uh, frustration. Absolutely. Pain. Fertile soil. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it, like when I was starting Earthlink, well, before I had the idea, I had spent like literally 80 hours trying to get my little Mac on the internet. PPP? Uh, PPP slip, you know, <laughs> yeah. remember old slip? Uh, Jesus Christ. If, and, you, if uh, you figured that out, you were a genius in 1994. Well, there was no Mac, there was no TCP stack in yeah. the Mac at the time. You had to buy one for 50 bucks. Um, Amazing. And uh, so, you know, but I came through that like incredibly frustrated and inspired. Right. Um, I had zero market research. If I called people up and said, hey, uh, what do you think, you know, do you want to get on the internet? They'd look at me blank like, what the hell is the internet? What is the internet? Why would I be there? Yeah. Oh, you can get information. R- well, well, why would what I need of, that? What do I need that? My, yeah, my life is perfectly, I have a fax machine to get information. Exactly. You know? uh, so I, I, don't, I don't put much in the market research in the traditional sense. What I, what, however, what I have used successfully is I take that frustration, I create an idea, and then I'll go and I'll I'll survey people on ways to position it, like how to name it so they'll understand sure. it, what to position it with. So mm. you can take something that, that they already understand and position it with that, ah. um, how to price it. I do a lot of research on right. that sort so of So these thing. are established things. When you're talking about pricing or branding, you're putting the brand into the real world where other brands exist. Right. You're putting pricing mm-hmm. into a marketplace with a menu of options. So yeah. of course, those are things you can research, but like a really good idea. would you be willing idea. to pay for it, et cetera? Yeah. And the cool thing about the internet today is, you know, it used to be I mean, when we did the e-companies model, we spent a million to a million and a half to get a company going, right? And we would fast fail if it didn't work. You know, we'd take it back. Yeah, and, and you the, the only and you only burned a million dollars. Right, exactly. So investors now, were fine. Now today, I believe we've we've achieved an order of magnitude increase in efficiency. Yeah. If you you should be able to launch a company if it's a webby type business for you know hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, and get some proof that it's really going to work. Correct. And in a way, the market research is in the market now. Is is my product baked in. selling? Is yeah. it working? As opposed to, you know, going to somebody with an idea and pitching them on it. Uh, drastically reduced. Thus, the reason we've had such great success with things like Y Combinator, um, TechStars. Uh, is that what is uh, David Cohen's? TechStars. TechStars in uh, Boulder. A lot of these fifteen thousand dollar, twenty five thousand dollar micro angel sure. kind of uh, things have have proven it out so and also for the open angel forum i know tyler uh who sorts through all the applications you don't tyler uh consider people who don't have a product built already do you right it even says on the form this is for people who have a product and so we're not angel investing actually in business plans or ideas correct and the reason you made a decision to do that was the angel investors are not interested for, uh, with very rare exceptions, and those rare exceptions would be that you've had a successful exit, and if you have had a successful exit, you're probably not emailing through the form anyways. You probably know somebody that we know, and you already right. have something confirmed, you know, committed to the round and everything else. So, And if you are um, so connected and you've had successful exits, you might just spend the $15,000 you, yourself to build a mock-up of it. It's mm-hmm. so simple. I mean, yeah. the, the people used to build mock-ups for... 
I don't know, $100,000, $200,000 with an art director and whatever, and they'd outsource it. And that wouldn't even be live on the net. But today, you can build it live on the net with all the open source software. So I think what you're hearing is the market is the market research. Well put. But Craig, did you have a specific thing that you're trying to do? or like? Mm. I, I, I guess I am, yeah. I, I have this... Uh, this product that I'm trying, you know, I'm, I'm building a business plan around. I, I have a really good idea of uh, what it is, and it, it is born out of my own kind of experience and experience with some with some friends. Like, I'm very comfortable uh, buying clothes for my wife, but a lot of guys aren't. Yes. And have an idea for, you know, maybe in uh, I, I have it pegged as an iPhone app that basically will help you do that. You know, it will it will say, you know, you go to this store, this size. That's that's going to fit your wife or your girlfriend or whatever, and you know broadening that out to okay, her birthday is on this day, so here's a bunch of places that have stuff on sale. So, so this is an that's iPhone kind of the app. General idea. It's an I, let me see if I can summarize this. It's an iPhone app that helps husbands and boyfriends not be the idiots that they inherently are when it comes to buying presents for their spouses exactly. slash girlfriends. Because hmm. you're gonna you know you're gonna go to the store and you're gonna buy them some kind of you know really tight wearing stuff and they're going to go that's what he wants me to look like you know I take some so. fat and you're going to you know or the opposite you're going to buy them something that's ill fitting and they're going to go ah oh, they think I'm fat so hmm. i wonder i wonder how to leverage cuz part of it is is try to think like the consumer right in the sense of you know, I think women, when they when they buy things, there's a lot of emotional reasons. Yeah. Right? It's not just logical. And you might think more logically about it. Okay, it, it fits her. It's in style. It's at the right price. Go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, part of it is, what if you took advantage, like uh, Open Social, you know, which Facebook just launched this week, right? Uh, the, 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 the open, more open, open graph. Yeah. The, you know, basically um, where you can... Uh, somehow leverage her friends to help you make that decision. That's so there is a brilliant idea. Connect in them and say, hey, I'm going to buy this. What do you think? And then it shows Vote up on yes their or no. app. Vote. Boom, boom, boom. And there's like five choices. 86% boom, boom, boom. of her friends said yes. And, and chances are if her friends like it, she's going to like it. Absolutely. And then when she buys it, they're going to, of course, want to tell her how great it looks because they're going to want to feel good about recommending it. Yeah. That's a really good idea, actually. If you if the iPhone application or it was a Facebook application just had you say, here's what I'm thinking about getting my wife for the anniversary. You're her friends. Please vote or give me other suggestions. Yeah. What a great uh, and you, service I mean, You that can would be. integrate, you know, because you're part of your wife's social network, so therefore you, you know, you, you have similar friends, right? You can integrate with literally with one line of code now, uh, you know, that, mm -hmm. that social graph into your experience. And so how do we just get from your idea to a better idea? Uh, what was the process there? Because that's what this show is all about. That's yeah, why I love it. Just, uh, evolving the idea. It was just a very interesting jump from what technologies, I think the way Sky made that connection was what technology is available and what uh, trends there are in technology, the open graph, and applying it to your core idea, which is how can I get my wife a better present or how can I be a better husband? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of interesting. If you, if you if you follow your bigger idea, like you're you're you started with, do I you know the pain point of did I get her something that she's going to enjoy? Sky just took it to a bigger one of like, hey, use a better way to solve that. Talk to our friends through this really easy way to do it. There's a bigger picture there of just how to be a better um, partner, which mm -hmm. I think is one of the things maybe guys struggle with. Uh, I know Sky and I don't. We're Phenomenal husbands, perfect, uh, in, every perfect in every way. Never pure complaint from our wives. Um, however, there are other guys whose wives maybe sometimes would want something more out of their husbands. So it's, it's sort of interesting the overarching theme. So I would encourage you to, to think big, and then act, you know, very decisively since you don't have a lot of bullets. I'm assuming. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> One thing is, you know, uh, it, there are very few successful app-only businesses. So. I w think about the app as an extension of a core of your core service, which is probably a web service. Right. So yeah. it should be on the web. It should be in an app um, as an extension of that, as an enabler for that. And now some of the critique in the chat room is th this feels like it's a hobby, not necessarily a business. Um, what's your response to that, Sky, when you hear that sort of like uh, response to it? Like, oh, it's too small of an idea to be a business. Well, the funny thing is today is, uh, you know, I mean, if you just look at I mean, this is a, a big example, obviously. Look at Apple's results yeah. this week, right? And Phenomenal. What, you know, they're just killing it. And 
it speaks to a couple things. One, that if you really focus on what you are passionate about, right. and you do it really well, and you do it consistently, and you just don't listen to everyone else. Right. You don't listen to the media. You don't listen to the analysts. You don't you, listen to pundits. Sometimes you don't even listen to your own customers. Right. Because you True. have a vision about what you can create. Yep. You stay true to that. And the second thing is, it just speaks to how big the world is. Yeah. It's all, it's rest of world that is knocking, you know, knocking the cover off the ball for Apple, right? Yeah. It's, it's a big world. Um, and I don't know what you're thinking about for international, because any, any web business today has to be international from day one. It is by default. I it, mean, you right. basically put anything on the web, it's 30% outside the U.S. Exactly. <clears throat> um, so... Uh, you know, it's true that it does. It feels nichey, right? Right, but uh, niche is the new mainstream right. in many ways. Yeah. So, you know, your overhead's low. You're passionate about it. I mean, go do it. You know, you know, it's not going to cost you that much. And, and the downside is zero. You, yeah, you learn. You learn something. Maybe you spend some money, but you know, you're going to learn a lot. And if you just keep at it. I would just I would make sure that it's something. I mean, my test is for a, an idea is that I continue to wake up every day and it's the first thing I think of. Right. You know, so it's right. not just a fleeting thought. If you really do have that passion for it, yeah. Because yeah, a smart person is going to look at the world and say, "Hey, I've got five better solutions to these five problems every day." I'm assuming when you drive out of your house, <laughs> you go, "Gosh, this should be better. This it's should be the, better." You have that entrepreneurial it's disease. It's the entrepreneur's curse. Yeah. You know, it's just, <laughs> and then how do you stay focused, especially if you're in the middle of building a business? Yeah. I mean, like you are, you're yeah. building a business, right? right. You're just having these ideas, that, you know, constantly hitting you. Yeah. And, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. It's, right. Stay it's, focused. It's as much about what you don't do as what you do focus on. The ADD of entrepreneurship. Uh, Great there call. Go. Uh, good job, Craig. And Thank uh, you. we will see you next Friday. Uh, at the 50th anniversary, uh, 50th episode in San Francisco. Good luck, Craig. You're coming in, right, Craig? <laughs> I would love to, if I could. I can't, though. I'm going to be in Minneapolis. You'll be okay. there virtually. We'll see you on the stream. Cheers now. Bye. Take care. Bye. All right, so that's how we do it here on This Week in Startups. You get a guy who's got a question, and all of a sudden it turns into tens of thousands of people getting to draft off that and learn from it. Um, Thanks to uh, DNA Mail for sponsoring the show. I think that they will have their 50th episode of sponsoring. It's pretty cool. The sponsors have been the same since the beginning, and it's been a year. So I can't thank these guys enough. DNA Mail, DNA Mail. Everybody loves DNA Mail. Complete exchange hosting, $2.95 a month. Uh, free 30-day trial, free activation setup, free 24-hour support, 99.99999999% uptime. If you're an entrepreneur, you don't set up an exchange server for yourself. You set up you know, some hosted stuff in the cloud, like DNA Mail, and they have Google, uh, Google support as well for if you want to get Google Apps and stuff like that. I mean, that's just, that is phenomenal, okay? two ninety five a month, I mean, I have nothing to do with right. the company, but right. like, that just speaks to how cheap it's gotten to set up a Ten business. years ago? Ten years ago, you have a full-time guy IT with a guy. ponytail, like, sitting there trying to keep the exchange servers running. Right. And, people, and it's like, oh, your PST files, and, those, and this is down, know, and there's a virus, and somebody you know, had attachments. It's, uh, wow. It's a disaster. And uh, now, thanks to DNA Mail, the world is good. Thank you to DNA Mail for being a sponsor I just from got, the beginning. I just got you another 50 episodes, too. Absolutely. We just signed them for wow, another yeah. 50. It's actually really interesting. They're tremendously loyal. Can I ask a question yes. since it's asked Jason? Yeah. Is, uh, the segment's over, technically, but go ahead. The studio here, yeah. I just want to point to the catering for, for everybody's benefit. Yeah. It's... Uh, it's a box of Cheez-Its. Yeah, absolutely. On a toolbox. Hey, to start up. <laughs> we have, I love it. We have we put out a beautiful spread for our guests. It's, Cheez-Its. It's great. And it's probably been here for 50 episodes. Well, so. that box has been empty for 50 episodes. <laughs> we, we've got through oh, those. Oh, that's just the bait and switch. You yeah. got me in here promising Cheez-Its. I think there's some and... cookies over there, too. They're, they're stale, though. We got those off a of Virgin American flight. Uh, Very nice. <laughs> uh, okay, so the next segment, uh, we're going to keep plowing through these. I like to plow through in the beginning of the show the segments you guys love best so that when you get your podcast, you can just turn it on and know you're going to get something of value. The next thing of value that you guys all love is, of course, the Shark Tank. And uh, we have Corey. Play some video segments in between. Here comes Corey. One second, we're playing. Everybody knows the story Shark Tank, the uh, horrible show on television by Mark Burnett, uh, who asked me to be on the show, and then, or as people asked me to be on the show twice, and then they never called me back. Uh, no love lost for the Shark Tank people, but we do it here and we do it better. So on Shark Tank, they basically bust the entrepreneur's chops, 
And they dangle money in front of them. They act like basically DBs. Yeah. Uh, databases, uh, no, the other DBs. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we do here is we actually uh, try to give really good feedback to the entrepreneur on their pitch, on the ability to pitch, how they could actually f do their 60 second pitch better, and then on the quality of their idea. And so as an entrepreneur, you know, sometime you're gonna be walking down the street and you see Sky Dayton coming out of a Starbucks or something, you say, oh my God, you're Sky Dayton, I saw you on Twist. Can I tell you my idea? He's gonna say, I have no choice. Of course, you can tell me your idea, you've got me cornered. And you got 60 seconds. And this is your make or break moment in life. Uh, and so you have him here, uh, and you have me here, and you've got 75,000 people uh, who are going to watch this. So there is absolutely no pressure. Corey, are you ready for your biggest I'm chance? Ready. OK, you know the rules. You have 60 seconds. I'm going to ask everybody in the chat room to score the idea. Uh, first, score the pitch. How good of a job did Corey do pitching his idea? On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the perfect pitch, you would just take money and throw it at him. Um, you know, an a, a seven or eight would be an average pitch. Five or six, you'd be like, this guy needs work. And under five, you'd be like, this guy needs to think of another line of work. Uh, and then on the actual merit of the idea, how good of an idea is it? One to 10. Everybody get ready. No, uh, sorry, Scott in the uh, chat room, you, do, you don't score yet. You wait until after the pitch. OK, so <laughs> people are jumping the gun here. OK, so everybody knows what to do. Score the pitch, 1 to 10. Score the idea. Everybody in the uh, studio is ready. Are you ready, Corey? I'm ready. 3, 2, go. Blazetrack.com is a website that allows you to seek opportunities and advice directly from industry experts and celebrities. We guarantee direct access with any expert or celebrity on our site. This is how. You have the ability to submit an audio clip, a video clip, a document, or a set of photos to any person on our site for a fee. The fee is determined by that expert slash celeb. In exchange for paying to submit your material, they will personally review your submission and give you a guaranteed video response within 30 days or you get your money back. Blaze Track generates revenue by taking a 35% cut of the fee. Imagine being able to submit a demo to a Grammy Award-winning producer, a design to a top fashion designer, or even a business plan to an investor. Every one of them will respond with a video within 30 days. That's blazetrack.com. Very good. Very good. You did it with eight seconds left. Everybody loves brevity. Um, Sky, you're our guest. Tell us, how good a job did you do pitching? Did you understand the idea? And then what do you think of the idea? Um, Wow, I have to think about that. I, 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 I'm not the kind of, of instant like. All right, bang, I will give you, you know, the instant. You, you, you're, you're better at that than I'll me. I'll give you the I'll instant since we do this all the time, and Tyler's got his ready, of course. I think your pitch is a 7.58. I, I understood exactly uh, what you did in the first 15 seconds. You have celebrities or experts who will look at your pitch for a fee and give you feedback. You made it very clear exactly what you do in the value proposition. And I understand the pain point, although you didn't explicitly say what the pain point was. The pain point is, if you're a singer or an actor or a business person and you want to get feedback on your idea and you can't get anybody's attention, maybe you can pay to get their attention. Uh, and their attention might actually be uh, valuable to you. So I, I like the uh, pitch. The pitch was very good. And I like the idea, actually. Um, at first glance, there's going to be a little bit of uh, payola. And maybe this seems like you know, a little bit of a scam. So you have to be careful, I think, on how you execute it. Uh, but if the fees were reasonable, I think people would actually pay. So if you paid $100 to have Robert Scoble look at your website and give feedback, or a designer who's famous, $500 to look at your website and give feedback, or, you know, Tyler to look at your pitch for Open Angel Forum, I mean, it's like paying a consultant, but uh, you're putting into a space where maybe people don't have access to them. Uh, Tyler, what right. were your scores, and what did you think? Uh, eight and eight. Eight and eight. Yeah. So uh, you want to expand upon that, or you just want to just say uh, eight Well, eight? He, you're starting off with the vertical of music specifically. Is that right? Are you start yeah, we're actually starting? We're actually starting with music, film, and fashion. OK. We uh, currently have over 200, 200 experts that are using the system. Yeah. Um, and so anything else, Tyler? Yeah, no, I think uh, in music specifically, specifically, it's kind of interesting. I, when I was looking, I saw this idea. Um, it'll be really interesting to see if this takes off, if it grows. And again, a lot of it's going to be on, based on how good of experts you can get, I think. Yeah. And so I guess somebody said here, isn't this like the slime that Jason is taking down with Open Angel Forum? You know, I, I understand that position. That w and I did have that little bit of response there. However, 
you know, people do pay consultants to help them with, you know, they, you pay a singing coach, you pay, uh, you know, uh, an acting coach. So it sort of feels like, depending on the price here that, and, and the expectation, like is the expectation, do people have the expectation, uh, Corey, that if I pay, and how, and how much are they paying on average, but if I pay a couple hundred bucks to, or a hundred bucks or 50 bucks to somebody to hear my track and get feedback on it, do they expect they're going to get signed, or are they, are they doing it really just to get the feedback? Well, they're paying either for an opportunity or they're, they're submitting for an opportunity or they're submitting for advice. Mm -hmm. See, also you have to keep in mind is that they're submitting to industry experts, untouchable people. These are very, very unreachable and inaccessible people. So it's not just submitting to just a, a random person that's on, or on the site. Like, we, you have to go through a long vetting process to be a professional on Blaze Track. I, I think you asked the right question, Jason. It was, what's the purpose of the person submitting? If the purpose is to get advice, yeah, it's basically like paying a consultant. Um, if the purpose is to kind of break through, if you're talking about the arts, for example, music uh, or acting or something like that, I, I just feel like it's got to... Uh, there, there's some sort of conflict. It's not the natural way that that stuff is supposed to happen, and maybe that's why you're saying, "Hey, I'm going to, you know, change the paradigm." Um, advice, it makes sense to me, but like if it's music and say, "Hey, listen to my thing," and you know, I'm going to pay you to listen to it. I'm just not sure that the person who'd be willing to accept a small amount of money to listen to something is going to be somebody who can move the needle for you. You know, there's a whole industry. Yeah. I didn't want to interject. Can I say this? The, yeah, go ahead. The celebrity or the expert, they actually post the opportunity. They say, I am looking for a new artist to sign. I'm looking for a new producer to work with. I'm looking for someone to submit a song that I can place on Britney Spears. Or they clearly, de they clearly define in their description what it is that they're looking for and what you are to submit to them. It's yeah. not just an open session where you can just throw anything you want at them and, and, and want them to respond. They actually have to determine and post exactly what it is. That sure. They want you to so, that, so, Corey, that's not a new model, as I'm sure you're aware. I mean, Hollywood, just go down Hollywood Boulevard and, you know, the people handing out flyers saying, we're looking for actors, we're looking for talent. And really it's a way for them to sell headshots and get fees from aspiring actors and musicians. I don't think that that's as powerful as, a, as an idea, because, again, it's already being done. Um, uh, as you know, the advice and kind of reverse uh, answers thing. Like it's it's a little like you know, you know I've got a business plan and I want to find somebody who's an expert to look at it. I've got a, you know, whatever. That's that sort of thing where you're where the where the deliverable by the person is advice and knowledge. I think that's pretty powerful. Yeah, and I wonder if there's something in the game dynamics where, if you know, if they are looking for somebody, if a hundred people apply at a hundred dollars each, and that's ten thousand dollars. The person who does get selected out of that hundred gets their track produced by this person or something, you know. So it's more exactly. like, yeah. you know, there, there, it's some sort of a prize, and somebody wins in a contest. Like, yeah, that's interesting. It could interesting. sort of add and to the dynamic. And that's something that leverages the web more than the offline. Because again, even that is being done in offline today, yeah. but doing it online, yeah, it's. it's what, do, what do people pay to get in touch with the current people? What's the what's the ballpark? I say the average fee is probably about um, ninety to a hundred dollars. But oh. you keep in mind, you know, also they're paying to get that video response back from that person. Yes, there are other sites where you can, you know, submit information and they can send you an email back. You're getting a video directly from a person that you would never have the opportunity to sit down and talk to. Do they have the rights to reuse that video? What was that again? I'm sorry. Do they have the rights to reuse that video? The, uh, the 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 poster the the person who's pitching, uh, not well, the. Well, we can they right, can they can actually, they take that video and, and for example turn it around to use it as an endorsement for their put it on their website. whatever put it on their website. Exactly. Well, Blaze Track owns all of the content that's on the site, but the user has to agree and the professional has to agree. And the way our technology is built, both parties have to agree that this video can be made public and then they can go and use it. Hmm. But if the, the professional or the celebrity says, hey, this is a private video back to you, I do not want this public, then that user is not allowed to, to use it. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. Hmm. We think you're onto something interesting. Um, I think what, one of the reasons, just in terms of, you know, we were on TechCrunch 50 and Open Angel Forum, and so we have a, a, a similar dynamic. People submit something, and we give them feedback. And I would say that, you know, the way we look at it is we give that feedback as um, we are blown away that people, you know, trust the conference enough or, you know, respect Open Angel enough to take the time to write in and, and put and submit something. So we sort of feel like it's our obligation or our duty to, to give a response. And so it sort of works off this reciprocation effect. You've, you've done something for me, I'm going to do something for you. So we actually take a lot of time to give feedback on their specific ideas. And so this sort of short circuits the, the uh, reciprocation effect of, you know, hey, I'm, I asked for help and you helped me. It's, it's, you know, putting the money into it. So I think that you're going to have to deal with that issue and, and convince people that this is worth it. Perhaps if some artist donated it to charity. So if I was, um, you know, Will I Am, and he's a great music producer, and he said, you know what, I, I will give you amazing feedback on your track for a $1,000 donation to Haiti. Um, that, exactly. that's, that's a really good idea. And I think that speaks to the, right. what's valuable to the celebrity. You, you can't pay Will I Am enough money right. to have him answer anybody's question, right? right. It's, but if you, if you put it in the charity context or, yeah. or, or, or mentoring or something, yep. then I think you're going to get a much higher caliber of somebody who's willing to, you know, yeah, sure, I'll take 100 bucks to look at somebody's yeah. track. I, again, I don't think that person who's willing to do that is a decision maker. Right. If, I mean, if they wanted to get your advice on a business plan, you just did it for free for the first person calling in, you're doing it a second time. Um, if somebody said, hey, I'll give a $1,000 donation to you know, a charity you work with, Make a Dream Foundation or whatever, would you actually take the time to listen to their business plan and actually give 10 minutes of feedback? I would, and if you said, uh, I'll give $1,000 to you, I would say absolutely not. Right. If you so said, there you I'll, have I'll give you, you know, whatever, yeah. name the number, I'm just that, not interested. Right. But if it's, yeah, if it's something tied yeah. into that, I think that's... Yeah, if somebody said, hey, you can sit down for an hour, listen to 10 pitches, give an hour of feedback, and in two hours of your time, $10,000 goes to yeah, charity, make a dream, and, you'd be yeah. like, yeah, I'm in. Yeah. It's like you're free rolling on it. Exactly. So anyway, uh, there's some feedback for you, Corey. Um, I have to give you credit. You're in the arena. You're making it happen. You've got a website, and you did a great job. Uh, so much to be proud of. Uh, everybody go check out Blaze Track, T-R-A-K. And do you have the, a Twitter account that people can follow and uh, communicate with you yes. on? What is yes, it? at Blaze Track. At Blaze Track. So very simple. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are a fan of the show, it is your geary, it is your obligation to help Blaze Track on their uh, path to success. So go follow Blaze Track. Let's see his follower account go up by a couple of hundred by the end of the show. And uh, good job. Thanks, Thank Corey. Thank you so much. Thanks, Corey. Do you have a favorite show so far, Corey, by the way? This is actually my first show. Oh, it's your first show. Fantastic. Uh, well, yeah. you got a good one. Uh, you've only got 48 shows to go back and listen to. It's only about 90 hours of content. But uh, you should be able to run through that in a week. All right. Thank we'll you. talk to you soon, Corey. Cheers. Bye. All right. Interesting. That's like the first time we've had somebody who is a first-time caller. How do we? How did he wind up on the show? Because his partner ah. in Blaze Track is a fan of the show, but his partner's in a meeting. He's like, ah. "Can I get my co-founder to do the pitch?" I was like, cool. "Okay." He did a good job. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know who else is doing a good job? WebSpy. 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 What great guys at WebSpy? Is that my commercials? Love it. It's you're a natural. <laughs> you, be, you, be, you belong on. I a, love on doing commercials. A, AM radio is not the same without you. That's I wish I that. I, I honestly, I some days, some weeks, particularly this week, has been pretty rough. This is the kind of week where I wish my job was just to be on the radio for three hours a day <laughs> with Tyler and Lon. That would be really. Would other weeks like that? You think about that, Tyler? Like, <laughs> we should all just quit everything we're doing, and me, you, and Lon, and whatever, should just do a radio show every morning. Yeah. It'd be so much easier. Um, but you know what? Uh, why do something you enjoy when you can be an entrepreneur and just deal with pain and problems? And, <laughs> gosh. Uh, but WebSpy deals with a lot of pain that you have on your network. And they provide uh, monitoring of all your server activity, uh, from employee internet access to mail service to web hosts, analyze traffic levels, patterns, errors, and more. They are a total log analysis solution. And uh, Jack, their CEO, was actually on the program. What episode was that, Tyler? Uh, you probably seconds. know the episode right off the top of your head. That um, was 31. Episode 31. You're going to go on, go back and see Jack on episode 31. Uh, they log all this stuff in an activity, and uh, really great guys. Go check it out. Enterprise 
small, medium organizations. Everybody can use WebSpy. And by the way, if you're a fan of the program, it is your duty, it is your honor, it is your geary to thank the sponsors on Twitter. Just say thank you at DNA Mail, thank you at WebSpy, thank you at Ustream, and thank you at PowerVPS, who I'll talk about later in the program. And now we move on to the interview. Sky Dayton, an epic career. Uh, it's funny to interview you. I mean, we're like, well, and also to call it a career. It's like it's all I'm done. You're old now. So I'm like some. Yeah, I just How old got off you the golf course. Yet? And I'm no. You're 38. Do I look like I'm 40? <laughs> Yeah. Do you, how do you? How old do you feel at this point <laughs> after so many companies? I feel like I got frozen around, uh, you know, 29 and, and right. never moved on. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. Do you feel that way sometimes? I do actually. Yeah. I, I feel like I have the same energy I had, the same sort of manic energy for entrepreneurship at 39 that I had at 29. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. All right. I'm well, there's our interview there segment. Go. Okay. We're <laughs> Everybody, all done. We you've got it. Made each Scott. other feel good. So absolutely. You know. Um, take me back to the <laughs> moment that you had the idea for Earthlink, and what made you decide to pull the trigger and actually do it? Because before that, were you an entrepreneur or not? Oh, yeah. Um, I've been an entrepreneur since uh, I was 10. So I, you're I a know. lemonade stand entrepreneur? Yeah. I, a window washing business was the first uh, one, my apartment building. Five cents a window pane and uh, made copies, uh, Xeroxes of a little post, a little flyer I drew up and put them under people's doors. And, and uh, I'm assuming these window panes, you had like a three by were, three or they something? Were, they were French doors. Oh, so, so I, you figured you out know, a way to game the system at 10. It was a great, yeah, five per side. And, you know, ah. a lot of video game money, you know. Yeah, so basically uh, five per side. When did you spring yeah. on them that it was five per side? Was that like a No, it was, was right it, there. It was, it was right it there. It wasn't in the fine print. <laughs> no, by the way, know. Mrs. Uh, Jackson, <laughs> right. here's your bill. Here's uh, your bill. Yeah. <laughs> It's not 85 <laughs> cents. It's actually a dollar seventy. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, that that's that's a simple thing. You know, you're looking through a dirty window one day, and you're like, wow, this window should be cleaner, and probably other people need the same thing. Right. That's it. You know, simple. Um, when you had that, did you enjoy getting money? What, like, because I know when I was a kid, when I was younger. It was like there was something fascinating to me about acquiring money. Hmm. Not in like a bad way, just yeah. like, oh my God, I can acquire this money and then I can go play asteroids for hours. I know, right, exactly. It's what you could do with the money. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, 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 the money has sort of to always been sort of a natural consequence of doing something that was valuable for somebody. Yeah. You know, as trite as that sounds, it's true. It's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the next uh, business that I would call any kind of legitimate business, the first real legitimate business where I had a DBA and had to file papers with the, the city and everything was a cafe a coffee house oh. when I was 19 um, and uh, and that came about from hanging out in cafes with my buddies and trying to meet girls and you know hanging out for hours and hours and finally we're like hey we could do this you know so we could meet girls we could and the, the irony is we started a coffee house and I never met any girls through the coffee house really I was always in the back freaking out because the espresso machine was broken or we were running out of milk or Whatever you know, or or the first year and a half we had the place and it was almost empty and you know we had. To was, deal where with was that. the cafe here or? It was uh, it was on Melrose in West Hollywood, huh. uh, which is a very interesting part of uh, Los Angeles, very sort of uh, trendy and hip and, and hip people and walk up and down the block. Yeah, there's a really great air, great neighborhood, and you know it, it literally was a year and a half, and this is something for all the entrepreneurs listening because. Uh, there were nights when uh, my partner and I were in the cafe, and it was just 8 o'clock, and there was nobody there. And it we, is we, the we, most brutal experience. Yeah, and we would be like, well, what do you do? You can, you can shut the doors and walk away, right. or you can persevere. Right. So we chose to persevere, and what we did you know, in that case is literally went it's flyers again, <laughs> right. back to the window washing experience, and we'd just take turns going up and down the neighborhood putting flyers on cars, giving 20, 25 cents off uh, a cappuccino. Yeah. Now, you know, fast forward to about a year and a half into it, steadily building up a, a base of loyal customers, serving really great coffee, really a beautiful environment right. uh, we created in this in this coffee house, and uh, we were packed, like literally so packed on Friday and Saturday night. We had to hire a security guard. We had lines going from the back, which is where the bar was, out uh, to the front door and down the block. Wow, um, we had we were on you know MTV's House of Style and in on the sh uh, episodes of Melrose Melrose Place and Julia Roberts was coming. What was the name in of the place? It's called Cafe Mocha. Cafe and Mocha. I still run into people to this day who are like who Cafe Mocha for them was a formative experience in their in their teens and their. You so know, somebody was meeting girls. Yeah, uh, you know it might not have been you, but girls. 
you know, writers would come, Quentin Tarantino would come and write there, and I mean, it became a really cool, uh, yeah. you know, hub of, of this of, yeah. of this West Hollywood community. So that was that was cool, but you know, it's kind of like you've you've heard the expression like an overnight success after ten years. Yeah. You know? uh, that happens all the time. Right. Um, so uh, I was doing that, and I uh, at the same time about a, about a year into it, I I started a computer graphics company. Um, and that was very successful. And then I tried to Computer get Computer graphics, it. you mean like Photoshopping images for Photoshop, people? Photoshop, Quark, uh, Adobe oh. Illustrator. And, so uh, you were publishing flyers for other small businesses? Exactly. We were in the flyer. <laughs> in this case, the, fl the small businesses were Disney and Universal Studios. Oh, okay. and so you were like making that. their brochures? We were making uh, one sheets and you know, movie posters and video boxes and things. Yeah. And the unique thing for us was to do it all electronically with Macs. Uh, when it when people were still doing paste up with glue and crap. this is like ninety one yeah ninety two which time some right? of your you know listeners probably weren't we're even born. born then we have some Gen Y um, people in the audience yeah well the good good Gen Y people it used to be I, how can I talk like this I'm not you know it's like <laughs> it is weird to it be it is old. weird it's like you you definitely crossed over at some point when you're like yeah. well it used to be blah 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 yeah we well, used to use Quark Express okay <laughs> hours from the day if you needed a font off. pack you had to get you had to buy <laughs> true type fonts and then you, you had to go to Adobe. A thousand dollars each for a font. You know, yeah, crazy. Adobe used to kill people for fonts. Was yeah. it like five hundred bucks for a font? Yeah. Or something no, insane. It was, it was nuts. It was twenty thousand. I remember buying a font set. Um, anyway, uh, you, you, you know, coming back around to your question, the the Earthlink experience really began with trying to get on the internet, as I mentioned at the top of the show, yeah. and um, you know, incredible frustration, but at the same time realizing pretty quickly that the internet was going to become the nas next mass medium. And I was like, okay, this has got to get easier. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, this was 94, 95? 1993. 93. And, and 94 is when I started the company. Ah. Um, and, and were you working for, uh, what's his name at the time? Uh, or working with the guys, uh, what's his name? Ron Bloom or? Uh, oh, no. No, uh, no. I'm no. mixing something up. I, was, I, I, I didn't have a job. You, you didn't know, have I was, a job. I had, I had my own company. I did have a couple jobs out of yeah. high school, but... Um, I think so, two jobs, but I uh, I quickly started my own. You see, there's a problem. When did you decide to actually turn it into a business, um, and how? Well, you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs can relate to this. You know, there's sort of a moment, and you can probably remember, like, with incredible clarity, that moment yeah. uh, when something occurs to you. And I was actually driving home from the coffee house uh, at around midnight after a meeting. Uh, you know, we had our meetings at midnight. Uh, because we're in the coffee business, whatever. Anyway, uh, and I was listening to New Order. Um, I think it was Blue Monday. Um, and I was on the 101 freeway uh, in, in North Hollywood heading yeah. to my apartment. And uh, it just clicked. I don't know. It just occurred to me, okay, I'm going to start an Internet provider. Um, you know, and there's a lot of backstory to that why I came to that conclusion. But I got it then. That was it. And uh, I went. And yeah. now, again incredible struggle to get from that point to a billion dollar company right right it was not easy uh there were days when uh you know the wheels were flying off and the axle was broken and the engine blew up and right. you know we're going 100 miles an hour down a hill and you have customers and you have customers like you know like, thousands yeah like your database blows up on i, I call it the valentine's day massacre 1995 uh, uh, Valentine's Day, literally our core user database, usernames and passwords just melted down, blew up, completely corrupted. We went to the backup tape, and the backup tape was corrupted. Ouch. And we're down for 24 hours. And you have to rebuild the customer database. Had to rebuild it. We got a, a forensic a database expert to come back, and come in and rebuild the database from the tape. Wow. Like putting it back together with tweezers, v, you know, CSI action. Oof. And that had to cost uh, 20 grand. Yeah, what, which you know we didn't have at the time. Yeah. But the irony is, you know, there again, you know, looking at today, you know, I got Earthlink to revenue for fifty thousand dollars. Amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't have a billing system. I had a two-line phone system. I did all the tech support. That was just to buy the equipment, get the office space, and take out an ad in Micro Times uh, that said Internet and had a phone number on it. And. Uh, Internet, get it. Internet, you know, you've heard of the internet. Well, you know, here's the number for it. Call up and get the internet. In 1994, if you called 411 and said, "Give me a company with the word internet in their name," right, none existed. <laughs> Call the 800 directory, right, all nationwide. Give me a company with the word internet in their name. None. So you said the name exist. of my company is internet. Yeah, no, I just said internet. You know, people were hearing it, people were talking about it. 
fill an, uh, an unmet need yeah. and do it well. Uh, and so company grows, you go public, multiple rounds of financing. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, it was an incredible learning experience for me. I was fortunate to, uh, you know, kind of have a philosophy of bringing in really smart people, surrounding mm -hmm. myself with people, a lot of experience. Just I just stayed focused on the customer experience, mm -hmm. um, the strategy of the business. You know, I ran it for the first couple of years, got it to, you know, tens of millions in revenue, you know, which is, I think, pretty good for a kid with very little experience. Yeah, you're 27 years old at the time. Yep. Uh, brought in a, a, a world-class CEO. Uh, actually, brought him as president, made him CEO uh, six months later. This is Gary. Gary Betty. Yeah. Um, just an amazing guy. Um, and the two of us as partners really grew the company from yeah. there. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess you say the rest is history. Yeah. Uh, and you get all that done, and then somewhere around 99, you decide you're going to start an incubator. Yeah, so Jake Weinbaum and I, Jake was the, uh, the chairman of the Disney Internet companies mm -hmm. at, at the Disney, Walt well, Disney Company. Dig. Dig, Disney Internet Group. Um, we, were, uh, we were snowboarding, actually, um, and uh, uh, got to know each other pretty well doing that, jumping off cliffs together and doing crazy stuff. And... Um, I don't know how he did. He had kids at the time. I didn't. But um, and one day we went to uh, we were at a meeting in the boardroom uh, at Disney with Michael Eisner and some other guys. And I had actually I brought in Replay TV, which is a company sure. I was an investor in in the early days, along with Mark Andreessen. And, Replay TV um, was TiVo. It before was TiVo, TiVo exactly. And um, they were actually the first ones to have the thirty second skip. Yeah, they were sort of the let, let's. You know, they they gave the finger to the uh, to the advertising in the traditional guys, and you know, yeah. it, anyway, uh, we had this great meeting at Disney, and uh, actually the Disney boardroom, you know, there there are literally inlaid into the wood in like mahogany or something. Our mouse is a mouse silhouette with ears and everything. Wow, it, it's yeah. Um, anyway, we have a picture <laughs> of Tyler on our boardroom. We have like an inlay of Tyler, Tyler's profile. Nice. Uh, we, uh, so we went across the street to, uh, Paquito Moss, a little taco place, and came up with the idea to, let's, let's not just create one company, let's create many companies, let's yep. create an engine to build businesses. Right. Uh, a factory for companies, if you will. And, uh, that, that's when Raised a hundred million born. dollars or something insane? We, we raised, it's interesting, in the incubator we raised very little. Really? Uh, we put in our own money, and, but again, that model, you know, a million dollars at the time, Million to million and a half. Wildly business. efficient. Very efficient. Um, we had a venture fund as well, which raised more. Mm -hmm. uh, but the incubator uh, was uh, was super efficient, and uh, uh, you know we we had some hits and we had some misses. Yeah. Um, and, what was the uh, um, cartoon network you started? Uh, Icebox. Icebox with Zombie High School. Uh, or zombie, zombie College. Zombie College. Yeah. Uh, I remember this. We uh, we were managed to. Uh, get some of the best writers in Hollywood. None of them have internet in their contracts. So right. you would have these studios paying writers, you know, six million dollars a year to run a show like The Simpsons or something yeah. like that. And it didn't say anything about the word internet. Nothing. Yeah. Again, that word internet didn't exist right. in Hollywood. Uh, so we signed them up to make shows for the internet. And it was a great, you know, great idea. We could produce shows very inexpensively in Flash. And yeah. With incredible rise, we had Larry David writing shows for us. We had, I mean, just really great stuff. stuff. Really yeah. funny, and uh, you know, Mr. Wong and Zombie College, and right. you know, uh, we we did that and basically ran into the that company was a victim of the first bubble yeah. pop, along with the fact that at the time, unlike today, there was no advertising model to support Zero. something like that. Yeah. You know, today you could a company like that could really succeed. Funny or die. Succeeding. Funny or Die is, is Icebox. Uh, is who are the other people icebox. who do like those funny Zig, um, Jib Jab. Jib Jab is a great Jib example. Jib another one. Yeah. Uh, Although, you know, Jib Jab's production cost is probably quite a bit higher than Icebox. You know? Really? Yeah. Icebox is a lot of quantity, funny. Mm. And the model was, and, you know, we had some really, we had some very interesting investors come in from traditional Hollywood that were seeing hey, this is a model to try stuff, right. build an audience, then take it to TV, as right. opposed to piloting things on TV for millions and millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. Which people are starting to do now. Right, now yeah. it's happening. So I mean, they find a lot of the web celebrities on MTV and VH1. Right. And it's Perez Hilton or Tilla Tequila or whoever. 
they just look on the social networks for whoever's got and a following. See where it's at and go to TV. And TV is, it's funny, you know, the web is sort of ascendant to this, the, the prime position in media, I believe. Yeah. You know, the web is the main medium today. Right. And then there are all these sort of legs to the stool, right? Right. And TV is one of the legs. Right. Now, you know, traditional Hollywood doesn't want to hear that, but it's true. Um, now, we were early in that case of Icebox. So, you know, it shows you can have a really good idea, but your timing can be off. Absolutely. Uh, and if you keep swinging the bat, you're going to hit uh, business.com. I remember a directory of business. Mm -hmm. uh, that sold for a couple hundred million. 330, I think. Uh, incredible. Oh, yeah. And Jamdat, which did games, was that right? Yeah, with Jamdat. Mobile Dad, games? Um, we, uh, we had a, basically the first dedicated mobile games company that got scale. So we had like jammed at bowling and Tetris and all these you know, great games, and that, that sold to Electronic Arts for about $800 million. Wow. So this fund, uh, what were the returns like on this fund? I mean, if you raised well, $30 again, million? the fund was one thing, and the incubator was another. The incubator, the incubator right. just done great. You yeah. Know, we, you know, we never talked about it, but yeah. it, it you know, did fine. Many, um, many times return. Did fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like an absurd return. And Boingo, um, you're chairman of. Mm -hmm. yeah. You were very early on Wi-Fi. Now you have 3G and 4G. How does Boingo exist? I, I was wondering mm -hmm. about this because I, I see more and more people with 3G, 4G connections sure. on their laptop paying $60 a month, and then I see Boingo for $20 a month in the airport. I'm wondering how does that happen? And now it's lowered price. Nine ninety five. yeah. So, uh, so, you know, the idea is... Is it really it, a big business or not? It's, or? A, it's a great business. Yeah. I mean, it's really uh, one of the best uh, subscription and Internet access businesses I've ever had a chance to be involved with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, basically, the, the idea is you have all these devices that come with Wi-Fi built in. So it kind of turn the model on its head, like whereas with cellular, you need to buy a device that's dedicated to a network. Yeah. With Wi-Fi, you're already buying the device whether you're using Wi-Fi or not. Right. Wi-Fi is on board. In fact, when I started uh, Boingo, a card for your laptop, a Wi-Fi radio. 300 bucks? $700. Wow. And an access point for your home or your business was $2,000. So you now, got in very early. Today, oh, way early. Today... Wi-Fi is actually, not only is it free, it comes built in, it actually costs money to take it out. Right. So if you try to order a laptop and I say, I don't want Wi-Fi, they have to go and rip it off the motherboard because it's already there. Right. So it's, it's built it's into from, the motherboard. It's gone from 700 to negative. Right. Um, so there are hundreds of millions, soon to be billions, of Wi-Fi enabled devices. At the same time, there are millions of Wi-Fi hotspots whether that's home or offices or public spaces. And in the, in the sort of public space realms like cafes, restaurants, uh, like airports, hotels, convention yeah. centers, there's hundreds of thousands of mm -hmm. those locations. They're all owned by different people. So if you want to connect, if you go from the airport to the convention center to the hotel to the cafe, you're going to sign up like four different times. That's a real pain in the ass. So I saw that really early, that there was going to be this, because of the low barrier to entry, and it's going to lower, uh, of, of setting up a Wi-Fi hotspot, there was going to be incredible fragmentation. Like it was just going to look like the most crazy patchwork mosaic of stuff, right? And consumers just don't care about that. That would be right. incredibly frustrating, right? Yeah. So they're not gonna, just not going to sign up for, it's hard enough to get them to sign up for one, let alone right. four. In fact, they won't sign up for one because they know it doesn't work in the other three places. Mm -hmm. So it kind of hurts everybody. Right. Right? If, if you can get them to sign up, then you can spread that recurring revenue over lots of people. Is and, that what Boingo does? Is it sign? Yeah, we, we have like hundreds of different networks that own, in aggregate, 130,000 hotspots around the world. Um, and Boingo and, users can and Boingo join users them. can connect. And we also happen to own and operate uh, airport, mainly airport Wi-Fi networks, which is where most of the traffic is. We have about, you know, uh, somewhere north of 40 percent of the emplanements that occur in the United States are through Boingo airports. Um, how does it work in airports? Does, does each one make a decision about it? Because I know sometimes I'll go to an airport and I'll see Boingo. Mm -hmm. That was the only option. Now I go, I see Boingo and like the Virgin American Club or whatever, and sure. then I see. Oh, San Jose has got free now. Sure, or Albany's sure. got free. Sure. Um, how does that work? Do, do they? Do you guys have like a uh, an exclusive to run it for a certain number of years? Is it destined to be that every airport just offers it free? Well, I'll give you an example. Yeah. So we we recently won the right uh, and deployed uh, Wi-Fi in all of the major airports in in the United Kingdom in uh, in like London Heathrow, for example, yeah. which is one of the biggest hubs in the world. Beautiful airport. I don't know if you've been there. The, the uh, new Heathrow. Yeah. Are you talking about the new part or the, the old new part? one? The new okay, one. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We went to the, <laughs> the old, old part, part is which was, I think, the equivalent of it was like going through a post-apocalyptic 
like 28 days later or something like that? As if like the yeah, zombies think, had ripped the town apart for three years, what would be left? That's I think what they we went filmed through. the movie in the, in that terminal. The, really? Yeah, 20, no, I'm kidding. It, it felt like yeah. it because we literally are going through like back staircases with dirt and like lights hanging down like this and sparks flying off of the, it was like a video no, game. I'm, you know, I think for your investors who are watching this show, it's good to hear that you're clearly traveling like the third class airline. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, I to, am. Are you kidding? <laughs> you, did, you, you did the connection, changed planes in Greenland and then flew over to. Well, the, that's Tyler, actually. Oh, I, fly, oh, okay. I fly over Virgin oh, right. you know, Premier, okay. but I, so, Tyler you know, goes over in Icelandic it, Air. Yes. It's all on average, anyway. Yeah, um, we average it out. Uh, well, anyway, the new terminal is beautiful, and we, you know, we basically uh, have the right. We basically are the exclusive provider of Wi-Fi in that yeah. location. Then we allow other carriers to roam into that into that network. Uh -huh. But we basically built the network. We maintain it, and right. we have guys that go, climb up in the ceiling and fix the. It's expensive to do. Right. I mean, it's yeah. got to be hundreds of thousands of dollars to do an airport like oh, that. Oh, millions of dollars. To millions do of an, dollars. An airport that's that big. Absolutely. I mean, we're pulling wow. in. We're pulling in. You know, T threes. I mean, we're we're wow. yeah, we serious bandwidth. In a big airport, um, and uh, you know it's a lot of work. So, so all of that is part of this uh, roaming system that you pay a fee to access. Right. It's one fee, one. You so know, it's ten bucks, and you can use it in Narita or you can. Well, yeah, and there's some international stuff where we pay more. So there's a roam. I'm talking about the domestic service for yeah. 995. Yeah. Um, you may have to roam charge. You, you may have some roaming charges. We pay more over there, right. revenue share, etc. But no matter how you cut it, it's way less expensive than cellular and a lot faster. Right. Coming back to your question, 3G, 4G, how does Wi-Fi fit in? Right. Let me give you some interesting stats. Um, you have a BlackBerry and you have an iPhone, right? right? Okay. The average uh, BlackBerry user uh, uses 30 megabytes a month of data. Okay. Uh, the average iPhone user uses a gig. Okay. So it's 30x the difference. Um, uh, we all know about the problems that the main carrier in the United States uh, that has the iPhone is experiencing. Yeah, the one we will not name. But. Due to the, basically the explosion right. of data use on, right. on that network. And, and you think that's the reason, not incompetence on their part? Oh, absolutely. They, they just were caught you know, off guard by yeah. how amazingly popular the iPhone is. Right? And the usage pattern on the iPhone. Because it's not just that there's a lot of them. Right. It's that the people on them you do 30 times. Right. So exactly. Now, if you now go from 3G to 4G, 4G is about a 6x increase yeah. in uh, speed and capacity. You're talking okay? about 800K a megabit or something? Yeah. I mean, you might get two megs, but it's, a, it's a really a capacity thing for the yeah. carriers. They're getting more out of the spectrum that they have, right? right. Um, that's a 6x increase to a 30x problem. Okay. Today, the only device that's really driving that kind of use is the iPhone. Android right. is on its heels and so forth and coming. But imagine a future where everybody is walking around with devices that are using multiple gigs a month. Because it's not just, we're not standing still. Cannot be still. done over that network. Cannot be done. 4G will. That, that writing is on the wall. It's, it's on the wall. So you know, with Wi-Fi, we have 83 megahertz of spectrum in a tiny amount of space. Right. right? So really, it's just limited by the backhaul. I mean, we can deliver How you know, many access tens you of megabits. Um, well, again, it's the it's it's concentrated in an area. It's right. in your home. It's in an office. It's in an yeah. airport hotel. Basically, the rule of thumb for the future is: when you're outdoors, you're on 3G or 4G. When you're indoors, you're on Wi-Fi, and the two work together. Um, AT&T is already doing that. You know, when you walk into a Starbucks, it's like get, it gets gets off the cellular network, tries to get on the Wi-Fi network. Yeah. Um, I notice it's doing that automatically now. It doesn't mm -hmm. even pop up a box. Right. They fi they figured out a solution to that problem. What is, yeah. what is that problem where I open up my laptop and it's like, oh, it doesn't work, but I have to fire up a browser and then I have to log into the Wi-Fi, and now sure. I notice I don't have to do that anymore. With a phone, you have a lot more control over that, ah. and there's also an expectation that the user allows a phone to do things for them. Right. If your laptop kind of did stuff for you, you might feel a little creepy about that. A little that. Skynet. A little like, whoa, what's happening as the droids are taking over. Yeah. But you know, keep in mind, all of this that we're seeing today, you know, we, we tend to evaluate things based on the present. Yeah. This device right here yeah. is just going to, this is a game changer. Huge. And it's, uh, it's a game changer because, you know, it's totally, the things we're going to do with this, right. they haven't been invented yet. Right. You know, I mean, yeah, sure. And the you time can, you use this you know, hasn't, is not normal internet time. You use this device in bed, 
Right, places you didn't normally in use the bathroom. The internet, right, uh, we won't go there. With we won't go there. Personal. I'm saying if you were like just happen to be sitting on the couch in your bathroom, you might right. take it out. But you've used this device, I assume, in bed. Your kids are Absolutely. using it in the car. Sure. You've taken it out in, on the line in Starbucks. Sure. Places where you it's might on be the looking couch. I don't use my laptop on the couch. You know, but I, I stopped I do too. Use this. It's, I it's used to so have my laptop much, out so every better. day yeah. watching the Nick games, and it's, now I'm using this. It's so much more of a casual experience. But you put this on a cellular network. It'll bring it to its knees. If it's not already on its knees, it'll put it. You know, if it's on its knees, but wait, it's they're put offering it the three G, and I just ordered one with three G. What is that going? You, you think AT and T is just, or the network that carries it is going to be? It's going to be very I just difficult. Think it's it's going to be a challenge. It's a. It is a, a device that has applications. If you watch ABC, you know the ABC client on here is Amazing. incredible. The picture Netflix. is so beautiful. Buttery. Netflix. It's just great. Butter. And at your fingertips, you know, not to mention upload and social and all the things that that you can do. Well, uh, I just think that gig a month of the iPhone, it's multi-gigs for an iPad. Yeah. And it's going to be multi-gigs for an iPhone, too, because of all the apps and, and things that you, can, that you will be able to do with in the future. So we need more bandwidth. Right. The, you know, consumers have an insatiable need for bandwidth. If, if you give it to them, they'll use it. They'll find a way. Developers will find a way to create amazing Absolutely. services that use it. Chat out. roulette. So all that comes <laughs> back around to Wi-Fi is a core part of the network infrastructure, and you know, uh, Boeing is in a great position. It's the largest aggregator of those networks. Do you guys uh, get to uh, let Boingo users into like AT and T at Starbucks or T Mobile? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're a Boingo user, the you can go into yeah, you can go yeah. right into Starbucks. Um, we have roaming agreements with all the major carriers, and then we let the carriers use us too. For example, yeah. Verizon uh, is now providing Wi-Fi to its customers via Boingo. So we, you know, we let them we let them rebrand it, and they pay us a wholesale fee, and they have access. Interesting. Uh, it seems like very complicated contracts. Like you guys are letting other people on your network, mm -hmm. you're letting your users on their network. How does how do you negotiate those contracts? Is it just like? It's a really interesting marketplace. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it, it, in the middle there. That's where the, we we resolve the complexity, and ultimately to the user, it just. Psh, they're just, they go so to that Narita is the secret sauce is some business development relationships with these people that you take the time to sort out. It's a lot of relationships. Um, it's a lot of technology to bring all these networks together and provide that seamlessness and monitor it and treat those networks as our own. Um, Earthlink was a grand slam. Mm -hmm. Business.com, Jamdat, Boingo, all home runs, clearly. Mm -hmm. Helio, spent three years on that, mm -hmm. four years on that. Probably three and a half, something like that. Yeah. You get hit by the ball on that one, or you, you got a single? You know, how, do you, how do you look at yeah. it now? Because you've been out of it for a year now. Sure, sure. And it wasn't a huge success like a, a Sky Dayton typical production. <laughs> um, what happened, and how do you look back on it? It was a great learning experience. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess that's what entrepreneurs say when they don't have a home run. It was a learning experience. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, we did some things that were really revolutionary. You know, I yeah. mean, I think if you looked at the reviews, I mean, the best review I ever got from Walt Mossberg was a Helio device, yeah. you know. And it was... A, and they were beautiful devices. I mean, beautiful. This was we designed South, them. These were from... From South Korea. South Korea. Yep. Incredible, like, pre-iPhone uh, technology. You know, uh, we were the first with social networking on a device. Yeah, MySpace. Uh, was with MySpace. Uh, we were the first with geotagging photos and uploading them. We were the first with Google Maps with auto finding you, GPS with Google Maps. Yeah. First one to do that. Um, we were able to work with just some really great partners. And, um, you know, we were the first with a unified inbox right. on a mobile device. All your messages in one place. SMS, um, email, everything in one place. And really, it speaks to even though we uh, we we knew we needed to get a lot of scale to compete in that business, it still wasn't quite enough. Hmm. And at the same time, the sort of macroeconomic environment, we just ran right into that. Yeah. Um, so it made it tougher. Um, we had the highest ARPU, average revenue per user in in the industry, about 100 bucks. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, so people really loved it and they used it. Um, but ultimately, if I were to point to one thing, and, and I think anybody who's listening or watching and thinking about um, getting into the mobile space, um, distribution is really key. Yeah. And that's something that I hadn't really had to deal with in any of my other businesses. You, right. know, um, you know, with Earthlink, you know, we just went direct. You know? We right. didn't have to go through any distribution. With right. Boingo, we just pretty much go direct. You know? um, uh, and so we had to 
literally try to beg, borrow, and steal our way into Best Buy and to Circuit City. And meanwhile, they're having their own problems. The Circuit City blew up in the time right. that we were talking to them. Yeah. You know? um, and so to be in the places where people can experience a device like that, um, this is, I think, one reason why Apple has done such an amazing job. They have stores. They have distribution. Yeah. And, they and you do, did some Helio stores. We did some. It's kind of experiments to yeah. see what would work. You know? yeah. And we learned a lot from that. What we learned is it's a... When you've got something that's really revolutionary, yeah. I mean, Tesla might be an example of this, right? Sure. Um, for them, to, for people to experience that car, right. right? They can see you drive it, right? right? But they really want to go to a showroom yeah. and talk to a dealer, you know, and drive right. a test drive one. They're not going to buy it over the web necessarily. Some early adopters will. Right. Um, but when it's a big purchase, a two-year contract and a commitment. Yeah, consider you know, purchase. Uh, you need to have that. Um, so... That was, that part was really difficult, and I don't think, um, I don't think I would do that again uh, for that reason. I mean, right. I, I, the w the great thing about the web is you can go direct to the decision. No permission. Maker. No permission. No middleman. No man, begging. No nothing. You know, you have to work. You have to SEO or SEM or whatever you're going to do with Google yeah. typically, but you can have that direct relationship. And how how do you reconcile a failure on your sort of incredible career? It, does it bother you? Was, were you depressed for a year? Um, ha, as an entrepreneur, how do you deal with it? Because I think we have a lot of young entrepreneurs who probably are not going to obviously have four or five home runs in their career. Um, you got hit with the ball, you know, whatever, seventh time up to bat. No big sure. deal. You can just go, hey, look at the resume. But yeah. uh, how did it affect you? How did you deal with it? Personally. Well, one thing is that I stayed with it all the way. I yeah. mean, I didn't, I, you didn't never, run. I never left the base right. you know, or home plate. Yeah. You know? Um, and we sold the company to Virgin, right. which later was bought by Sprint. Right. And if you were involved in that transaction, you actually did okay. Right. So, uh, you, so know, you saw it through. I saw it through, and um, uh, you know, I got maybe I got it to first base. Right. So not a home run. Right. Um, you got on base. On base. Um, but I think you know, I, I didn't. I didn't think about it. You know? right. I mean, I, I mean, of course, I'm disappointed that it right. wasn't a home run, especially because we had such a great start and right. we had such great people. I mean, the, the, the it was team a pretty incredible team. At Helio yeah. is there, we just had rock stars at every level. You know, right. I mean, I got, I mean, I, I used to joke is like a, I had a couple dozen people you could build a company around. One of those person, one of those people you could take and build a company around that person. How often do you find that? And they, yeah. typically you have two or three of those guys, which must make the yeah, which must make it not working out even more, you know, challenging to deal with because there's so yeah, so many yeah. good people and it I was, it was one, really uh, yeah, really one, probably one your things, best execution, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I well, I mean, the brand was yeah. beautiful, the product yeah, was beautiful. I mean, on, on a lot really, of levels, really, you really yeah. nailed it. Yeah, I mean, look again, uh, you know, I think if it were today or in the certainly economic environment, the last few months, you know, maybe we could have pushed through that, right? Right, but when you deal with a headwind that's that strong. Yeah. One of the things about, I think, that makes a great entrepreneur is great entrepreneurs don't usually have a reverse gear or a neutral. Yeah. They just have a forward gear. Right. You're like that, right? Yeah. You just keep plowing ahead. doesn't matter how crappy the day is or the week is. Yeah. You just, you, you're not going to stop. You're not going to go backwards. No. You, you just keep going. You know, you're, you're on to the next thing. And, you know, I was able to... Uh, uh, Focus more on my family a little bit, and, yeah. and uh, had an amazing year last year as a uh, in the, in the market buying parts of companies at fire sale prices and yeah. um, helping Boingo, and you know it's been good. So you think you're going to start another company or be full time ever again, or do you, you enjoy just doing the investing advising thing? Um, I uh, I'm thinking about things constantly, and uh, I've got a few things knocking around and. You know, when the time is right, I'll I'll do it or I won't. But so, uh, feels I, like it feels like you're you're gonna get back on the horse at some point. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're too young to retire. Uh, yeah, I can never retire, right? Right. <laughs> what would that? What would I do? You know. Uh, but uh, I uh, I I right now, all I can say is this is an amazing time to be an entrepreneur. I mean, so, it's so much better in many ways than in 1994. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and, and that was an amazing time. Yeah, it was and, an amazing time because it was before everything, and nobody knew had a clue what was coming, right? And so if you had some prescience about it, bang, you know. And people believed in young people, and yeah. money was free flowing. If you had an idea, 
sounds like today. You know, it <laughs> in actually some ways. is. I, the only difference is today, the competition for any good idea is so fierce. Yeah. And I think that is a good thing, right? It, it, you know, in the late 90s, we had a lot of that belief in young people. We had, a, we had funding like crazy. We had yeah. all these things. But we had, uh, you know, not enough competition, believe it or not. Right. And so a lot of things got funded that really shouldn't have been. Today, the... the there wasn't a Darwinianism to it. Right, exactly. The, the natural selection today is a lot... Uh, m the crucible of that that goes through. Yeah. Uh, to come out of that, you're going to be strong. If you... You if can't you start be good business, today. You've got to be insanely great. great. Yeah. And that, for, for great entrepreneurs and people who have real passion and integrity about what they're doing, I think it's a great time. Right. And interestingly enough, people said the time that we came up as entrepreneurs, the mid-90s, early 90s, people said that would never have that time again. That that was a moment in time, and that was the best it would ever be for young people coming into the market. And then look at today. It, I agree. It is easier to start a company today. There is more funding than ever. Mm -hmm. It's smarter funding. Yeah. It goes further. Um, what a great time to be an entrepreneur. Agreed. I wrote an article uh, in 1999 called The Internet Still a Ground Floor Opportunity in yeah. 1999. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people at the time thought, oh, it's done. You know what I mean, of course, we went through it. And then when the bubble popped, everyone was like, oh, yeah, that's definitely game over. Right. No, it, it wasn't. I mean, look at the size of the web and the size of the, the aggregate market cap of the Internet space today versus 1999. Number of users. Amount of data consumed. Right. There's as many users on Facebook today, probably twice as many, on Facebook as it was on the entire internet. At, yeah, at, 400 at million. Right. I mean, yeah. So. Uh, and truly global, obviously, in nature now. And then you have the unknowns um, that pop up, like iPhone and iPad and YouTube, streaming video. I mean, these things were not even who'd on the roadmap. Who to thunk? Who to thunk? Twitter. I mean, you were there early yeah. with Twitter, right? Yeah. I mean, what were sure. you, user number seven or something? And I was in the first three months. Yeah. yeah I mean, you know, who, who would have thought that would become a global platform for communication? Yeah, you know, and, and so, login system of Facebook. And, yeah. and anyone who says, "Well, that's done and can't be done," you know, it's over. There's a next Twitter. There's a next Facebook. Absolutely. You know, there's a next whatever. Uh, let's get uh, our news, our crippled news host, Lon Harrison here. We're going to need like five guys. I've people wondering where has Lon Harris been? Lon Harris broke his foot. I'm not even kidding. He was walking outside on a cell phone. I think it was uh, an iPhone. And uh, so, seriously, Apple, probably at fault here. It's probably going to be a lawsuit. But walked outside the building, and uh, are, we are we literally rolling them in? Yes, we are. I love it. Well, I, I can, I can this is dedication. I can, I can take it from here. I didn't know Aaron made a wheelchair. You guys going to help him with his chair over here, right? Come on, Derek, help him. Here's a special new graphic. Nice. He's a very... You, want to put your you guys foot didn't see something? the crutches. Or, yeah. Lon literally in came in here on crutches. He, they rolled him in on his Arion chair, <laughs> and he's here. I hate, missing, I hate missing the show. I don't want to miss the show. I know. It's very difficult uh, when you miss a show. And the show is not the same without you. It's Sky Dayton, Lon Harris, Lon Harris, Sky Dayton. Uh, you're a pretty competitive guy, uh, Sky, uh, correct? I guess you could say that. <laughs> And you've always been competitive. We've never played poker, so we would never know. Never know. Never. Actually, the truth is we actually host the, the poker game that doesn't occur at the Wall Street D conference. I don't know what you're talking about. Exactly. This is year three or four of the... Uh, is this four or three? One, two, three. This is four. Four, yeah. This yeah. will be the fourth year we've hosted it, and boy, has this be... Or we might have hosted it, and this has become quite a brouhaha. Uh, if it happened, it might have had, like, Chad Hurley and... Terry Semmel and all kinds of interesting people were playing high stakes poker together. It was if it happened. If it happened. It's all it's theoretical, theoretical, if it happened. Really. We were playing for points, truth be told. <laughs> but I know the table I was at last year had about 30,000 points on it. Free, freeze points? <laughs> what points? Freeze points from no, Freeze Crowd? No, it wasn't Freeze Points from Freeze Crowd. It was actually we were playing for uh, Zynga chips. Ah, nice. Actually, we're literally playing for Zynga chips because. Uh, with Zynga chips. With Zynga with chips. Zynga chips. Because yeah. our friend uh, does that. Well, you can uh, plant some soybeans now. It'll be good. Okay, so let's go through the news and we'll try to wrap the show up in the next 15 minutes. Fair enough. Uh, wow, lots, lots of news for 15 minutes. Uh, Facebook. We could probably spend 15 minutes just on everything with Facebook this week. Let's hear it. Uh, 
lots of changes. Some were announced at the F8 Developers Conference that they had, uh, an event this year. Others have already launched. Um, perhaps the most immediately obvious change is the controversial titled the controversially titled Open Graph Integration. Uh, basically extends Facebook's like and share features all over the web, not just on content that's on Facebook.com. It's already on blogs like Mashable, information sites like IMDb. There's even a bunch of sports sites. So you could go in, like on IMDb, I was trying this out the other day, you can go like a movie, any actor, you can share that information on your Facebook profile. Ditto, like if you go to ESPN.com with athletes, ditto if you go to Mashable with posts or bloggers. Uh, and then it'll actually show up back on Facebook. Robert Scoble has estimated that within a month, 30% of the web's most popular sites will have Facebook social integration. So the first question, would you consider adding the Facebook system to Mahalo pages? And what advantages does this have for people who aren't Facebook? I mean, obviously, if it's Facebook, it's great. You're getting tons of content. But well, how does IMDb or Mashable benefit from this? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I have here the Mashable uh, integration up, and I just clicked like, and I, I'm not sure exactly what I liked. Did I like? Uh, if you click it on this individual post, you like this post. Uh, which doesn't make any sense. Like, why, why do I have to like this post? But if it was for Blippi or for this author, it would make more sense to me. Yes. Um, I think it's obviously a great feature. You can see here on Mashable, having 1,600 people retweet something and 758 share it and 250 people buzz it. This is very powerful for SEO. It's very powerful with just social sharing and, and spreading it. If you don't have these things, every site has these three right now, and we'll have this fourth one. If you don't have these things, you're, you're just basically going to get left behind. Right. Um, however, I do think that uh, this like will be replaced by a global like system. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Facebook is um, really disingenuous when they say open social because they're the one company in the space, them and Apple, that really does not play nicely with other companies, does not play nicely with their users' data. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that's a good long-term strategy. Uh, but, I mean, it's, it's not holding Apple back. Uh, so I think that somebody will make a like system that will let you like something in 10 places. Right. And, and, and that will be the one that will win. Uh, and somebody will probably build it so that when you click like, it, it likes it on. Uh, Facebook and others. Right. And then Facebook will block that, just like they block <laughs> you having the ability to take your own social network out of their system, you know, if you wanted to pull your graph out. Right. So I've got my own problems with Facebook, but you know, they're they're on a tear and everybody's gonna have a Facebook page and why why would people rebuild the graph if the graph already exists? Um, that's really the issue. And it's yeah. the same issue that people who are fighting Apple and the iPhone, why would I create another app store if that app store already exists? Um, and that, that's the Android conundrum. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a long, hard battle. Tyler, you have an insight. Do you know what this feels like? It kind of feels like shaking hands with Steve Wozniak. It is. That's an incredible insight. Insight from Tyler. And you know what I mean by that is, at first it sounds good, like, oh, good, Facebook's going to live on my favorite blogs now, and I don't mm -hmm. have to go back to Facebook to paste the links. I can just share. Right. But there's also that kind of icky feeling, like something could go wrong. Right. Well, that, that actually ties in beautifully with the next thing I was going to discuss. But I just want to point out why he says it's like shaking hands, hands with Steve Wozniak. Wozniak. I have a famous story of meeting Steve Wozniak mm -hmm. for lunch. I, I have a little OCD about germs. Just a little. Tiny. If you go through Mahalo, there's like germ stuff everywhere. Like if I see somebody lick their fingers, I would tell them like, do me a favor, please don't lick your fingers. It's absolutely disgusting. I, I've said this to multiple people who I work with. like. People will judge you by that. Please don't do it. So I go to, what is it, Bob's Big Boy in the Valley is the original yes. McDonald's? So yes. I go to, Waz is like, hey, let's get lunch. And we're like, oh, great, Waz. I'm always a big fan. I go to Bob's Big Boy. He comes racing literally into the front door on a, on on a, a Segway. A segway. Yeah. So like, he's like, boom, like right into the front door. It's like shaking, like he bangs into it. It was just like something out of a movie. And he's got the helmet on. Sure. And Safety Waz first. is like... Big. He's a big guy. He's a large guy. He's a large guy on a large Segway, banging in through the front door. The people there are like, oh, was. You know, everybody loves him. The, the hostess knows him. We sit down. He's sweating, you know, and it, we're just we're having this like, incredible conversation. And he orders the whatever the burger is. And he starts eating it. And it's spewing juices and <laughs> mayonnaise, ketchup. I mean, they, they have a special sauce, and they put layers of it on, and, and he's ketchup on the fries. His hands are just, it looks like a surgeon. 
basically, right. mid-operation. His <laughs> hands like this, and he goes, "You know, Jason, I really." Oh. And he proceeds to lick all ten yeah. of his fingers. I'm and not I, into the finger and I, licking. And not just lick him, but he licks him like up to here. <laughs> you know, like the second yeah. knuckle. <laughs> so this is in the first ten minutes of having a burger with him. And for the next half hour, I'm thinking, I'm going to have to shake hands with him. <laughs> so I can't do anything uh, but look at his hands the whole time. Because yeah. my brain is going crazy. And I've told the story to Tyler, which is why he sort of it's, it's, has the, yeah. that's why it makes sense to him, uh, yeah. like most of his insights. Right. We finish. We get to the door. He says, Jason, I love everything you do. It's great. And he grabs my hand and starts shaking it and puts the other hand on top of it. Uh, and he's yeah. shaking my hand with two hands. And I'm just thinking, oh my God, I got a Waz sandwich here. And I'm like, great meeting you, Waz. And like, I walk out like as if I'm going to my car. He takes off in the summer. I immediately turn rack around. I go, <laughs> and I got my hands out like this. I go right to the bathroom. There's no offense to Waz. I, I have a thing about germs and everything. And I am washing my hands. And you ever wash your hands twice? You've done it? Do you have germophobe too? But when I'm, a, when I'm gonna perform surgery. Yeah, when you're scrubbing in. Yeah, yeah you do right, like, like, So like, I wash my hands once, I dry them. And after I dry them, I, like, I'm sort of like feeling my hands, but I can't. I've emotionally got the, right. and I go back and I wash them a second time. And it's nothing to do with was. I just my own OCD can lick work. their hands like that. You know. oh, so just a, it's a it's a small insight from Tyler. But anybody who, if you lick your hands, it's like being somehow involved with Facebook likes button. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> wow. I think we're, that's going to end up on a T-shirt. I think that's why it's a thumb. That's why it's a thumb, right? You're just like, taking the thumb. It's a licked. It's wet was thumb. taking the thumb and putting it in there and just. Yeah. So, by the way, the, the idea that you had, thanks for the Waz story, by the way. <laughs> uh, the idea that you had about the one like that's universal, mm -hmm. I mean, add this kind of has that, right? That little module you yeah. can add and you can say, and you have to do them individually, right? Right. So somebody's got to make a global one that's I, open source. Right, exactly. And, and, and then I'm, I'm not sure if this is where you were going with it, mm -hmm. but you know, or, or this is what you're going to talk about next, but I, I thought one of the most powerful things about the Facebook thing um, and, and its efficacy for websites and for anybody who's trying to build traffic is the, I show up at a website for the first time and I see my friends are already there. Yeah. And the way they implement that, the site doesn't get to see anything because all that data comes directly from Facebook via an iframe. Yeah. Right. Um, I, thought, I thought that was pretty powerful. And nobody else other than Facebook could do that. Right. And the privacy issues and everything, I, I don't really, you know, follow that exactly, but in, there are definitely issues. But I think if you're trying to build traffic and you're trying to make something really approachable for the first time, uh, it's pretty powerful. Yeah, I mean, imagine if you went to a Mahalo page and it said, you know, these eight of your friends have already visited or been on this page. I mean, I do think that there is something. That is where I was going. Yeah, yeah instant uh, endorsement. You know? Yeah, there, there is. Um, it, it's been a privacy debate and a debate about, you know, just sort of making things yeah. more accessible and opening the web up yeah. in that way and making everything you go to on the web more social. Uh, with all the data flying around sites like Yelp, Pandora, Microsoft sites, uh, there is concern that users will lose control of some of their private information, including your employers, your hometown, and even just the things that you like. For example, previously apps using the Facebook API could only store user data for 24 hours, but now that restriction is gone, apps can hold on to your data forever. Uh, also, Facebook Connect, the old way they used to do, sort yeah. of like link this with Facebook, that's gone, uh, and the new system is just way more integrated into sites and therefore more robust, but it does mean when you go to Mashable, you see all your friends who've been on Mashable and their pictures just come up. They didn't have to authorize it. They didn't have yeah, to say... Yeah, this was my blog log. If they, went to, if they yeah, went to Mashable and liked something, it's recorded that they were at yeah. Mashable and their picture is just going to be this on Mashable. This is really bad. When you go, yeah. so uh, and I'll, the, the other one other thing is for many aspects of your profile, like your hometown, your educational background, there isn't a way to make these private at all anymore, except deleting them. They've gotten rid of any turn on and off the privacy. Yeah. You just have to not have that information on Facebook if you don't want to share it. So is this setting a dangerous precedent? And when Zuckerberg says he uh, he thinks quote public is the new social norm, yeah. do you agree with him or do you think that's going to bite him eventually? I think it's going to bite him. Uh, there's also lawsuits that have gone on. This is setting him up for more lawsuits. I guarantee within 30 days there will be multiple class action lawsuits about this. They, th those guys will find a way to figure out how somebody's privacy was seriously damaged by this. For example, you're gay. I went on a gay site. I'm not out of the closet. An employer sees that I'm gay. 
and I lose my job or something, I get some sort of sanction because of it, which was right. the Netflix, when Netflix put out their user data. Right, and they were you could like identify lesbian films. Exactly. Yes. Uh, and so uh, it feels like a soft issue until you get burned. And so it's, it's one of those issues like pollution, like you don't think about pollution until all of a sudden, God forbid, like there's like 10 kids who have autism in your neighborhood, you know, or breast cancer spreads in some Long Island town like happened, you know, uh, like, like has happened. So um, th this is a train wreck waiting to happen, I think. And I don't think Zuckerberg is a very intelligent guy when it comes to privacy. I don't think he's very savvy. I think he's wrong, his position is wrong. And I think he's got no scruples or morals about it. Um, and so you combine a sort of might is right, I have to build the largest thing ever, and that attitude he has about privacy, mm -hmm. and it equals massive lawsuits, which he's now been in, what, three or four lawsuits over privacy and had multiple settlements over privacy issues. But it's massively innovative, and it's going to provide a lot of value. So the, it's basically he's innovating so fast and so hard, and he's so effective at innovating that I think he is basically compressing all the privacy issues into like a three year, he's basically forcing every privacy issue within like yeah. a three year window. And <clears throat> you know what? There is an entrepreneurial strategy that says, F it, I'm going to do whatever it takes and I'll deal with the ramifications. If I get a hundred million dollar fine, what does it matter if I build a billion dollar company? Which is what Microsoft did. Oh yeah, we're gonna get fined. Oh, we destroyed Netscape, we have to pay a billion dollar fine. Great, we have a $200 billion company, who cares? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, I think that's the, the Zuckerberg stealing ideas, appropriating ideas at an alarming rate, not caring about privacy, uh, is what's led in a lot of ways to his success. I mean, he stole the original idea from Facebook, right? And well, if you read that book, uh, The Accidental yeah. Billionaires, it's, it's sort of a two two cases. Like the Connect You guys were the ones that really the the Winklevoss yeah. brothers uh, who accused him of stealing their idea. They were pretty different ideas. Connect You was right. very well. Strictly even a beyond that, site. he basically did screw them over by he, well, and and the transcripts that Business yeah. Insider put out saying him. Zuckerberg saying, I am going to screw those guys over yeah. and not deliver their product and deliver my product the week right. after. With, without a doubt, he was telling them I'm working on and, your product, yeah. and during that time, he was basically putting their product aside I, I and think, building his own product. I think the kid's got some gene problem or something, because he like and he hacked into the Harvard Crimson journalist emails, according to that story. Yes. Which is, uh, felony, right. which is a felony, which I think is still... Uh, actionable. Actionable. It's under seven years. Yeah. And so, I, you know... I, I don't trust that guy. I don't think people should. And I think Facebook has a very dangerous um, impact on the web. And I don't think that other companies should support them, but I don't think companies are in a position not to support them. Yeah, I mean, at this point, that's, that's the if, problem. You don't, if you don't connect with these new features, you're going to be the one block It's like, oh, I, don't, I, I, I disagree with, I'm Dell, and I disagree with what Windows is doing to Netscape and bundling the Internet Explorer browser. I disagree, but i got to sell computers. So I'm not going to be the one to... You know, take it on. Anyway, I'm I'm kind of disturbed by it, but I'm also inspired by his innovation. So it's funny though how how success brings with it all of that attention and somebody always looking for an angle, the yeah. dark side. You know yeah. what I mean? Like the book you described, things yeah. like that. It's and, and I mean, I, you find that a lot. I mean, uh, there's there's some good Steve Jobs books out there yeah. that really try to state that it was all an accident. You know that he just accidentally achieved that success. Right. You know, and it's so, I'm not saying you're saying, you're not yeah, saying no, that at all. No, I think but he's it, driven and incredibly smart. You know, again, you know, we're talking about startups, we're talking about entrepreneurs and things like that. And, you, you know, the, the sort of, uh, I think of it as sort of nullification of the entrepreneur. You, you find that it'll sort of yeah. come in. I, it, was a, it was a book about Steve Case at one point, right. AOL. It was like, oh, he just sort of happened to he got kind lucky. of. He was sort of like, uh, what was it, being there, you know, it was like yeah. Peter Sellers, just sort of wandering <laughs> around, bumping into yeah. walls and happened to create, you know. Yeah. The biggest there's online no, service. There's no you know? accidental billionaires. I mean, the title of the book. It, yeah, it's it's ironic too. The title yeah. of the book. It implies something. That it just that's not just not ca true. There's causality. Yeah. Uh, there is something though to successful entrepreneurs. Uh, you you referenced it earlier with, when you talked about the iPad of a singular mm -hmm. vision mm -hmm. and not listening to your customers and not caring to a certain extent. Yeah. And I think Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and Zuckerberg all don't worry about these kind of issues. I think they worry about building a product that changes the world. And if, there, if some people get run over, or some moral ethic issues, moral or ethical issues get bent or broken, that, that's just part of progress. I think that's, right. and you know what, what? I'm starting to change my own position on it. 
What is that Jobs quote? Uh, I'm here to make a dent in the universe. What, what else is the point? Or why even bother otherwise? Right. Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's not, look, it's not, the, the, uh, being ethical is, I think, very, is part and parcel to being successful. Right. Right, because eventually it just catches up with you. Right. Right. But you find that the guys that have very high integrity usually are quite ethical. It's just that you're going to step on somebody's toes if you're right. making a dent in the universe. Right. You know, yeah. it, it's just going to happen. So I think deafen yourself to that. You don't listen to it. You know, right. if, you, if you're onto something really good, they're going to come out of the woodwork. I mean, I, I, every, I didn't have a single positive article about Earthlink during our fastest growth phase. Right. It was all about how we couldn't handle demand, how it was going to melt Busy down in a second. It's like, I think that the LA Times was, uh, headline was Earthlinks in the clouds, but some of them are angry. You know, and it was like all about how it started off with the user complaints. And, and this is at a time when we just could, we're just exploding, you right. know? So, yeah, journalists know, are like the funhouse mirrors. Yeah, I mean. just, ex <laughs> you know, it's like, yes, it's a reflection, yeah. but I'm right. not actually 12 feet tall. Or I'm not actually, brilliant. you know, two feet tall and fat. Well said. Wow. You know. But they do. They do. That get, was are, worth me coming in today. Just that's that a good. That's a good. Gonna, gonna, little quote. Don't, if you see me <laughs> use that in the future, yeah. just right. to check. Will Take be it. I don't. I don't care. Work. Anyway, uh, <laughs> moving on. Well, I got at least two more that we right. have to get to. People are demanding to hear about it. Uh, the Blippy credit card issue this morning. So okay. Blippy social service that allows you to share purchases you made on services like iTunes, Netflix, Apple, uh, and Amazon if you're clever and you use Gmail because you can't directly hook it up with Amazon anymore, uh, was caught in something of a controversy this morning after it was found that four users' credit card numbers were appearing in Google searches. So if you search site colon Blippy.com and the phrase from card, you would find certain users' Citibank, MasterCard card numbers in with the credit card transaction info. So it would say they were at Quiznos and they used this card to card, and actually the card number would appear. Uh, so obviously a lot of people got nervous about such a serious apparent privacy breach, especially considering that Amazon.com has already declined to share its user info due to what they were calling security concerns. Uh, Blippi co-founder Philip Kaplan has written a response. He says that this has been sort of blown out of proportion. It was an isolated incident from months ago during beta testing. Blippi now has the ability to comb through all of that raw data it gets from companies like Citibank and remove any personal info like credit card numbers well before the information is ever published to Blippi. Uh, he also reminded users that no one can use your credit card info without your permission and that you aren't responsible for fraudulent purchases. Yeah. So how big of a PR disaster is this for Blippi or is it one at all? And do you think long-term it's going to affect people's willingness to sign on for the service? Okay, so obviously I'm one of the three angel investors in the company, sure. uh, along with Evan Williams and one other person. Um, I don't speak for the company, so just give a disclaimer, and I will basically give you my two cents on it um, outside of it, and I haven't talked to Phil today yet, mm -hmm. uh, but I will send him a note telling him that he did a great job handling it. Uh, you will make mistakes as a startup, and how you uh, should be judged is in how you handle your mistakes. Not that you made mistakes, since all right. of us do make mistakes. Um, this mistake is a serious one on an optical and PR basis. It's a minor one in terms of reality. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the good news, is that people, the consumers did not get damaged. Right. So that's the good news. And they say they're in contact with all four of these people, yes. and they'll and figure so out the credit And so to explain a situation. little deeper into the background, when they were in beta, before mm. they launched, some credit card companies where they were forwarding their information back saying Jason bought this at Coffee Bean. It turned out some credit card companies, when they put that stuff on there, the receipt says on this credit card, they put the actual number. Right. Now, if you get your credit card receipt at any restaurant or whatever, take a look at it, and it doesn't say your credit card number. It just says maybe the last four digits. It's stripped it out. X's out a bunch X's of the out numbers, things, yeah. So anyway, they were stripping that stuff out, but it would sometimes be in the metadata. Mm -hmm. And they've got since gotten the metadata out. They had to you know, build this technology. Yeah. But it turns out a, a very small number of companies and or providers would actually print your credit card number on your receipt, which is mm. crazy and not yeah. a best practice. And it was all mm. Citibank MasterCards. Right. So basically, Blippi had no idea that this was coming or that somebody would actually do something like this. So therefore, it slipped through. It got through. And actually, uh, now it's just in the Google cache. How many, how many users? Four. Four. Four I mean, users. With the four cards. It's just like, yeah. flush this. Let's talk about something. I mean, exactly. it's like blip. It's a blip of nothing. Yes. You know? Yeah. So I agree. But it is. It, it, it does give fodder. And this is a good startup conversation, which is when you, do, when you, when you slip up and the mm -hmm. house of mirrors makes it look like it's, you're 12 feet tall, 
it's your job to actually I mean, if the headline educate was people. four users credit card information exposed. Yeah. Would anybody read the story? I, I can go to the any department store here, jump in the dumpster and have and 40 people exactly. exposed. Exactly. Go to a restaurant. Yeah. Uh, you know, the waiter uh, the waiter has been exposed has to 50 well, you know, that, that is what, a day. That is what Phil Kaplan said is that well even if somebody did this Google search, happened to pu across this information and then used your credit card, you're still not on the hook right. for yeah. what they buy. It's a fraudulent purchase. Yeah. And so right, anyway, exactly. he, I give him an A for handling it. I think it's a minor issue. And he didn't go into the denial thing that some CEOs no. can do. Oh, it's not an And he immediately an reacted. Like, just, really, yeah. really good, clear blog post yeah. laying it all out. Yeah, everything they totally happened. honest. And they acted to solve it. Moving on. All right, moving on. Uh, job hopping. We have to talk about this one. Oh, boy. Uh, so two days ago, you wrote a tweet saying the following. Quote, free advice for entitled Gen Y trophy kids. <laughs> if you spend 12 months at a company over and over, you look like a flake. Uh, this prompted a lively discussion on Twitter, with many people arguing with your contention that it's not enough loyalty to spend a year at a company, or citing all kinds of extenuating circumstances like the company going out of business yeah. that might cause a person to uh, switch jobs a lot during a short time period. Uh, frequent twist end this week in uh, this week in venture capital guest Mark's sister jumped into the fray. He wrote a blog post advising business owners and CEOs never to hire job hoppers. Sister says they make terrible employees because they lack loyalty and are only in it for themselves. And that uh, you're, you know, you're sort of not in it for the hard times. You're there for the good times, yeah. and then when the hard times come, you're switching out to the next uh, to the next company. So I've got uh, two questions about this issue uh, for you and, and based on Suster's post. The first one, is it fair to dismiss someone on the basis of a resume if you've seen they had six jobs by the time they're 30? I mean, should you at least set up an interview and find out why, or is it just fair to assume that they are just a flake and they can't commit? Um, just to give a little background on this, uh, I did not ask Mark Suster to write that post, and I did write that flame over some specific instances that occurred at Mahalo over there the last week. There was some unpleasantness last week. Yeah, yeah, unpleasantness in the last week. Um, and I personally feel like if you come to a startup company, you should put in three years is reasonable. Uh, I ask people to do that when they start here. And you've been here for three years. Tyler's been here for over three years. And, you can, and a lot of people here have. I become an undying, loyal supporter of anybody who makes it to year three. And what that means is I will... In, you know, introduce them when they start a company to any venture capitalist or billionaire or investor I know. I will help them get a job anywhere. I will call anybody in my Rolodex and give them a personal recommendation. I will make the phone call myself and do an email introduction. I will hire them at my future companies if I can. Uh, I am wildly loyal to those people. And I'm, I'm working on a blog post just to explain this because I think that it's not just what, how you get tagged as somebody who flips jobs. Mm -hmm. It's what you miss by being loyal. And I understand, you know, greed is good, and the whole Ayn Rand and, you know, objectivist, you know, do what's right for you and you're doing what's right for the world. Mm -hmm. And I also understand Gen Y trophy kids who are like, you know, I need to get mine, you know, Jay-Z, whatever, on to the next one. Right. I, I can relate to all of those, Gordon Gecko, to Jay-Z, to Ayn Rand, and, right. and, and, you, and I quote those people sometimes. Mm -hmm. And people would say that I'm very in line with that. However, loyalty is very important in life. And as you get older, you realize how important it is. And I was always loyal to Mark Cuban, and he always invested in all my companies. And God, the guys helped me like you wouldn't believe. And I've had that experience over and over so many times that now I am extremely loyal to people who are loyal to me. So would I, when I see a resume to your question and I see a bunch of job hopping, I, I might not meet with them. Yes, that's correct. If I see a lot of job hopping, I might say, this person is not going to stay here for year two or year three. And that's when the company is going to really get effective you know, production out of them, and they're right. going to really make an impact. Uh, so why would I take on a problem child? And I will look at them as a problem child. And so the message to Gen Y people, and you can cut this, is if you do work at a place for a year, you look like a flake, and you miss the opportunity to actually experience year two or three in a company and have the loyalty of your coworkers and your boss for all eternity, you're doing yourself a disservice. And there's always more money somewhere else to be had. There's always a better gig. And if you set a pattern of, I'm going to get 5% more you know, every 12 months or every six months or whatever it is, 10% more, whatever, 20% more, it doesn't matter the percentage more you're getting the next jump. You miss out on the quality uh, and the lo loyalty and the experience of putting in two or three years at a startup. Now, if the startup sucks, if they don't treat you well, if you're not learning, if your boss is a jerk off, all that's out the window. But if somebody can't stay in one job for two or three years, over a decade, 
something's wrong. I, I, and somebody tweeted me, oh, I, I've been at 10 companies in eight years. And I said, I wrote back to them, it was probably just bad luck, all 10 went out of business, right? <laughs> and they were like, no. And I was like, oh, well, it was probably impossible for you to stay there because all 10 were bad companies, right? And they're like, no. <laughs> well, okay, well then you've just basically, old people look at resumes and say, and you know what, they did it to us when I was Gen, Gen X, putting Gen Y aside. For the Gen X people, they said, you only worked the company for three or four years? Do you remember that, Scott? Like, it was like, only three or four years? Sure. Uh, you have to put 10 years in a company. You know, like, I'm not gonna hire somebody who jump jobs every two or three years or three or four years. So they, you know, I'm an old fart and I'm sort of telling this to the Gen Y people. But I do actually would like to uh, announce a special, oh, wow. a special trophy I have, I've had made specifically for this occasion. This is my Gen Y trophy. You know Gen Y trophy kids, what that means? They, they got participation trophies. Nobody was ever a oh, winner, yeah, nobody was yeah, ever a yeah, loser. Yeah, 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 so I actually yeah. had one of these made. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it says excellence in showing up. Showing up. <laughs> so this is for anybody from Gen Y who actually showed up for a day of work. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm gonna give it to you because you're sort of Gen Y or you're Gen X? I'm Gen X, I'm 1978, so I'm pretty Tyler's solidly not. But anyway, in Anyway, well, I'll give this, I'll hand this over to somebody in the office who's Gen Y. Gen and y. they did an amazing job showing up for showing work today. Up. Congratulations, they, they made it. you made it. <laughs> And now you get your pat on the head, and you get your trophy for, for being excellent in showing up. Yeah. I do have a second question here. Oh, wait, wait, I want to hear Scott's response oh, okay. all this. Well, you, see, you see a bunch of jumping around on a resume, do you? I, I would first ask why, you know, I mean, because someone may say that they left a job on their own volition, but they didn't. I mean, they were let go. Mm -hmm. So the reason that they were, you know what I mean? It might yeah. not be that good just end. hopping. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, for, I only had two, like I said, jobs right. uh, before I started starting companies, and, sure. and, and each one I had for 12 months, right. just so you know. Um, but you lasted uh, how many but, years at Earthlink? Were you involved? Oh, you are know, you still involved? 14 years or something. Right. Um, Boingo, how many years? Uh, 10. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, you, you Proving can't. My point. The point is that you, you, if you go somewhere thinking that you're going to have a hit in a year. When I start a company, I think of it as a 10-year commitment. Right. That's what I, that is always my belief. Um, if you're going into a business, I think you should find out whether it really fits with what you're trying to achieve in life. Right. And if it doesn't, you shouldn't stay there. Right. Um, but when you find that thing that fits for you, then you spend the rest of your life doing it. Right. You know, I mean, I think that's the thing. It's like, it's like if you're just chasing money, if you're just chasing a bigger paycheck, hey, there's a lot of jobs where you can make a lot more and you'll be miserable. Yes. And you'll turn around in 50 or 60 years and be like, and look back and say, what did I accomplish? What right. did I do? What did I do for the world? What did I do for right. my family? Right. Um, what did I do for myself? I'd rather yeah. make less and have fun and know right. that I'm doing a good thing. So I would tolerate some jumping around until somebody found out, some fast failure, if you will, to use sure. an entrepreneur's term, right? If it's not working, get the hell out of there and yeah. get to that next thing. There's no point in waking up any day dreading what you're going to do. There's no indentured servitude anymore. No. You know? Yeah. We're all We're free. way past that. Exactly. So, so that's the plus. I would look at it a little bit. I, I agree with you on that point. Right. And I would try to look at it in and multiple And holistically, you got to look. I mean, maybe somebody is great and maybe they did have a, if I see three years, you know, or three jobs in three years and they're 24 years old, maybe I'll look at it differently when sure. I see somebody who's 35 you, you, years old. Th there are also people who have stayed around that shouldn't have stayed around. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Because so that can be a tenure can be a bad sign. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, this person again, never it, moved on. Yeah. Interesting. So here's, here's my other question, because this was something people were bringing up on Twitter that I didn't see a, a real response to, and it interests me. Um, so you, if you expect that level of loyalty out of your employees, right. what kind of loyalty should employees expect from employers and companies? Yeah, uh, they should expect um, that they will be employed, and that the employer will do everything they can to develop them as a person mm -hmm. and support them, and that any problem they have, whether it's personal, or professional, they can come to their boss or their company and say, hey, I'm having a personal problem, can I get help? You know, I have a sickness, I have an addiction, I have you know, a divorce, I have whatever. Uh, a parent who's sick, can, can you help me? And they should expect uh, professional you know, uh, growth, and they should expect for the rest of their lives, if they've dedicated a couple of years to a company, that that person would return their phone calls, be a reference, all those things. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's the sort of if things are going well. If things are not well and it's not a good fit, they should expect nothing, and the company should expect nothing. You know, if the person doesn't do their job, then they should go. If the company doesn't do their job, 
and it's responsive, they should go. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why whenever anybody has a personal problem, I say to them, take a month off. And you've seen me do this to people. Take sure. a month off. Take two months off. Your job will still be here for you. Uh, in one case, take three years off and go to prison and I'll have a job for you. Uh, which happened with one employee. And we even have an employee here who left for probably a year and a half, two years, and who came back? And who came back, mm -hmm. right. So I sort of keep that open door policy. Two Tyler, you have an insight. had two of those that did two, that. two of those, yeah. yeah but I true. think the part that people don't know, and I'm you've never mentioned this, and I think it's one of the most uh, impressive things about you, is two of your former bosses, um, like every time we're in New York, Mike and Elliot, you anyone who met you with them or went out to you would think you guys were best friends since kindergarten, right? And this is these are your former bosses, right? And you don't. It's a very interesting dynamic. I am incredibly loyal to my former bosses. Yeah. Mike Savino, who is in New York, was one of my first bosses, and Elliot Cook, who works as the VP of operations here at Mahalo. Uh, both, you know, he's been with me for through two companies, and he hired me for my second job, and Mike hired me for my first job. I, I'm incredibly loyal. But to those we people. go to New York four times a year. Yeah. He's the only person you call every time you get to New York. Yeah, absolutely. I have to see Mike when I go to New York because my whole career started with Mike. Yeah. And you have to be loyal to those people. So, that, I mean, that is my way of being loyal. And also, I think it's a gratitude exercise, which if you look at happiness in life, I've done a lot of, there's a lot of good books on happiness, authentic happiness. There's a thing called the gratitude exercise. If you thank the people and you appreciate the people who've done things for you, you have a very good life. You feel good about yourself. Uh, and it's a really good exercise to do. And Martin Seligman has a great book, Authentic Happiness. He's the head of the American Psychological Association. And he has actually a really good um, exercise. Take somebody who's been pivotal in your life and your development and write them a thank you letter and explain to them exactly how they've done something nice for you. Or take them to dinner and just say, hey, I, I want to take you to lunch or dinner. And I just want to explain. I, you probably don't realize this, but you, it was very pivotal in my life that you helped me. And, and here's how. And here's how it's affected me for the last 10 years. If you do that, I can, I can tell you there's very few moments in life that are as joyful as that, as thanking a mentor, or just thanking somebody who helped you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what, the, that's what loyalty is about. And when you look back on your career, you, you only have a handful of times when you can really say, like, you know, th there were people like that. Mm -hmm. And you should be totally loyal to them. And it, and it, it, it builds over time, like a wine, like an annuity. It just grows and grows. That those people will do anything for you. And you'll do anything for them. And that's really what's special. Putting it aside, I, I, I sent an email that I probably shouldn't have sent. That was a snap reaction to somebody who resigned. And I said something snarky. And it's on the internet. People can Google it. Somebody went to a big company. It's, it's out there. <laughs> and I said, basically, for backgrounds guy, like, oh, congratulations. You know, this person who resigned after a year. I said, congratulations on being employee number 4,287 at X big company. You're going to hate it. By the way, it's a competing company. You can't come back to the office. You know? And yeah, I, I was a little on tilt. Cause, and I'll tell you the reason I was on tilt. I really liked the person. They were growing. And we had just put them in a management position two weeks ago. Yeah. And it's like really disappointing that the person didn't even just come to me and say, hey, I've got this competing job offer. Um, what should I do? And I could have told them, here's the benefit, more money, here are the costs. And, and talked it out with them. And I probably would have, they wouldn't be on my like blacklist now as opposed to my massive loyalty list. And I will write people off forever if they quit on me. And if they don't, I will cherish them forever, fund their companies, which I did in three cases, get them to open Angel Forum, get them to TechCrunch 50, do whatever I can for them. Right, I think that was the... It's kind of binary with me. I probably shouldn't be so binary. Well, but that, I think that was the issue that people were talking about is a lot of people that I was reading felt like, well, it's easy for a guy like Mark Suster to say, you have to be loyal. You have to give a company everything you've yeah. got. You have to stick around for five years. It's like, well, hey, that guy's made it. Uh, the people who are on the other end are the people who, you know, when you're just an employee and you feel like, well, I could be let go at any time. This company could fold at any time. I could be out on the street. Like, and I think that's the important issue to, to make, that it, it is a two-way street. You, you should expect loyalty from employees and Instagram, but, you know. Th th yes, has, you could be let off. A company way. could, uh, a startup company it could. Ha it has to go the other way. There has to be, like, some measure of sort of respect in both in both scenarios. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're going to lay people off, giving them enough time is, is, exactly. would be the respect issue. Exactly. Know, and really trying to redeploy them. I don't know. Do you deal with these issues at companies? You've oh, never had to deal oh, with these. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, your point about acknowledging people and everything is is really key also. You know, I mean, it's, and 
it's a, for me the thing that builds loyalty is treating somebody as I would want to be treated. Yeah. Always. And at the same time, just doing great stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's nothing like productivity, real productivity, right. meaning you're not just make, doing action. You're actually seeing a product right. come out the other end. Nothing like that for morale. I right. Mean, that does better than any number of happy hours or company bake offs. Bonuses. Whatever, bonuses, money. You know, it's like I made a great product. Yeah. It's thrilling. Bring it home to your kids. It's your legacy. It's what yeah. you made, you know. That's, I made something in the world that matters. Yeah. Okay, last story. Wow, there's so much there. Well, how to pick a last story? I'll give you the choice. We can talk about Foursquare, we can talk about Hulu, we can talk about Palm, or we can talk about the Juju device. You pick. Foursquare. Foursquare, Foursquare it is. Uh, so according to TechCrunch, a number of companies, including Yahoo, Facebook, and Microsoft, are all actively pursuing the acquisition of location-based check-in service Foursquare. TechCrunch is guesstimating the sale could be north of $100 million. If you were CEO Dennis Crowley, who already had a bad experience once when he sold his startup Dodgeball to Google, only to have it dismantled, would you sell it at that price? And is taking a $100 million deal and turning the company over to someone like Yahoo, who may run it into the ground, as they have with other acquired products, is that selling out, or is that just being a good businessman? Um, there comes a time when somebody offers you a disproportionate uh, amount of money mm -hmm. for your company. Uh, you have to look deep inside yourself on a personal basis. You have an obligation to take that money for your family, for your extended family, for your employees, for your management team. Like it can be truly transformative to be independently wealthy and not have to work and all this stuff. It's a very great place to be in life and sometimes you do need to walk away from the table with your chips. Um, and then other times you look at it and go, gosh, this is my life's work and I want to give up my baby. Mm -hmm. It's a very personal decision. It's like getting married or divorced or any of those kind of, or having a kid. It's a very, very, very hard decision for people to make. And there's no one answer to the question. Um, in this case, if they're offering 150 million or 200 million, that is way outside the bounds of what the business is worth today mm -hmm. by a factor, maybe two, three. You know, maybe the business is worth 60 million today. 70 million is what a VC would put money in and on, and VCs are aggressive. So, in reality, it might be a 50 million dollar business. But um, I, I don't know how much money he made the last time. I get, I get the sense he made enough money that's comfortable. So I don't think he's going to sell. I don't know. How do you make that decision? I really don't know what their their circumstances are. Yeah. I would, you know, I'd look at the numbers of the business and try to figure it out. You yeah. Know? I mean, what's the decay rate like on those? On those users, and I mean, we know it's growing, but they did just hit their one using? millionth uh, sign registered user. One millionth registered Foursquare user was this week. Yeah, so. I mean, a hundred dollars per or two hundred. I mean, it's where. It, what's the trend? Where is it going? I mean, yeah. I do think uh, that is check-in is a, is a feature of something really huge. Yeah. Uh, so you know, they're definitely on to something. Uh, and like you said, I think really well, you have to evaluate like. Well, you can take the money and sort of walk away, or if you really think you're doing something amazing, tell us selling. You know, yeah. you know, do it, build it. It's a, it's a very difficult choice, um, and so I don't think the only the only person who can really weigh all those factors is is Dens, you know, the, the founder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not easy, but you know what they call that a high class problem. Yeah. Exactly. And so you could should be, be happy to be burdened with this could question. Be worse. Could be a lot worse. And what he could do is. He could just, and this is, the, this is the option I like, that's a new thing in the market that didn't exist when Sky and I were first building companies, which is, I would like to do both. I would like to uh, raise 50 million, 25 million of which will go to me and my employees, and 25 million will go into the business. Uh, this is what people like DST, the Russians, who have been investing in everything under the sun, uh, and also other people have been doing, um, like uh, venture firms and private equity firms. So they realize that it's, really tempting for young people with a hit or even older people with a hit to, to sell and to get them to go longer. I know WordPress did this with Matt Mullenweg and Dig did this with Kevin Rose, two great young entrepreneurs. I think they got to take low millions off the table. I don't know. I don't have any inside information, but I think if you know young people like that can make a couple of million dollars and keep building the business to year 10 and be able to buy a loft and buy a car and have a million dollars in the bank or pay off their parents' mortgage, like, okay. That seems well worth it. So yeah. I love the new options that are out there. So I don't think that this is an all or nothing. If I was, and, when he, and that might be exactly what he's doing right now. He might be building up the value and getting a venture firm like Excel or somebody big like that who really wants it or benchmark because they want the nameplate. They want to be in on the next thing. Yeah. 
it's important for some of these VCs, they'll pay a disproportionate uh, fee to the value to get the branding of the, of the startup right. uh, so they can get more money from LPs in the future. It's a little sort of unknown thing. Um, so that's what I would do if I was him. I, was he I would hedge. It's, in poker, it would be a semi-bluff. <laughs> right. you, you know, you, you have top pair, but your kicker sucks, but you could hit your kicker, or you, maybe you've got a flush draw. So, yeah, sure, I'll call this bad, or I'll, I'll raise, you know, and let's see what happens, you know. Maybe right. the person folds. Maybe I'll bluff and the person folds. Maybe I'll lose all my money. I mean, that's the other thing. You can become point cast. Right. And then you really, that, that will burn a hole in your stomach. That'll make you bitter if you had the opportunity to sell for a lot and didn't. So it's... it's very complicated. But one thing that's not complicated is Power VPS. Yes, they provide <laughs> cloud hosting, 30 day money back guarantees, upgrades to fill your growing needs. And boy, do they love the twist uh, guests and they love the twist call ins and they love twist in general, so much so that you get 25% off for life. Yes, I did say for life uh, if you just use the code twist. So sign up today, get yourself a server, a virtual. Uh, hosting solution and know that forever you will get 25% off, which means you're probably a break even client for them. They might even lose a, bit, a little bit of money and you're probably getting it for cost at that because they don't probably don't have more than, I don't think they have more than 25% margin. It starts as low as $59 for a month and boy have they been supportive. Um, and uh, everybody needs virtual hosting and you think about the startup costs when we were doing it, it's like you had to spend a quarter million dollars on Sun Microsystems machines and a million dollars, half a million dollars on your Oracle license and you have to, to give a $50,000 a month to Global Crossing, and now you can get $59 a month to Power VPS and get your dream started. Boy, do they support entrepreneurs and tell them that your Uncle Jason sent them if you are a fan of the show. Thank at Ustream, at DNA Mail, at WebSpy, at Power VPS. Anybody who thanks the sponsors uh, is invited to come to the show next Friday in San Francisco. What an amazing show. Uh, this week at Android is next at 4 o'clock. Tyler? If you want to get on the list for the next Friday show, because it is kind of limited capacity. Limited capacity. So they can sign up at tinyurl.com slash twist50. tinyurl.com slash twist50. And there is a sign-up form. Twist 50th episode tickets. Fantastic. Uh, put your Twitter in there, and uh, we'll get you in. It's going to be a fun party. Yeah. It's going to be food, booze, whatever. Yep. We'll probably go to an after party at 5A5 after. Yep. Little after party. Mm -hmm. um, Sky, great having you on the program. Yeah. Thanks for finally Thank coming. You. I won't shake your hand because I. I <laughs> you can totally shake my hand. It's awesome. Yeah. I have just a bathroom for a second. Can somebody get me some? Uh, <laughs> you can lick it on my fingers. Uh, Tyler, wonderful insight today. Thank you for uh, that. Lon, mm -hmm. feel better. I'm, I'm working. What's on the status it. of the foot? Uh, so for I, the fans who want to it's, know. It's still very swollen, and I'm not allowed to put any pressure on it at all, doctor's orders. Uh, so I'm in a splint still, which is not very secure. But hopefully within a week or two, I can get a walking boot on there, and then I'm in the clear. Then no matter what I do, I can't really hurt it again, and mm. it's just healing. Six weeks, I should be right back to running decathlons mm. as I was doing Absolutely. prior well, to the injury. Congratulations injury. on showing up today. Oh, thank you. Here's your award. <laughs> It was, you, you it did was it. challenging. It was Hold challenging. You actually get an award for I it. I actually had to. We'll uh, see I'm you next time <laughs> on this week's startups. Spiked out. I could trip a referee. Tell by my attitude that I most definitely need from.